call the meeting to order. Good evening. I am John Samia, Chairman of the Shrewsbury Board of Selectmen. On behalf of my colleagues in the Town Manager's Office, I want to welcome you to our in-person June 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. In addition to tonight's live broadcast on channels 30 and 330 and Facebook, tonight's meeting will be rebroadcast on channels 30 and 330 and available on YouTube starting tomorrow morning. From now until our next regularly scheduled meeting to be held on Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve bills, payrolls, and warrants. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Have been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 aye here. Motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda, the minutes of June 8th, 2021. Everyone's had an opportunity to review the minutes. Any questions or comments? I'll entertain a motion to approve. Move approval. Second. Have been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is announcements and reports. I have one quick announcement. It is uh, recognizing our colleague Beth Cassavant, who has been named a 2021 Commonwealth heroine. Uh, she's been nominated by our state representative, Hannah Kane, for the award presented by the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women and it's given her significant contributions to our community. Um, and as it said in, in uh, the release today, that this award honors women who don't make the news but make the difference, and Beth has done a tremendous amount for our community, and congratulations on your award, Thank and you. well-deserved. Thank you. Any other announcements? They bring none. Next on to Town Manager's report, Mr. Mizikar. Uh, good evening, board members. Just a couple quick updates for you. Uh, first, I wanted to advise the board that we received our first portion of American Rescue Plan Act funds from the Commonwealth. We applied late last week. We received half of the uh, town direct uh, contribution. Uh, as you'll recall, we're anticipating about $11.5 million um, from that program. Uh, this first portion uh, totals 2016000 million. Uh, we will expect 50% of our allocation because we uh, sit within a non-functioning county seat uh, within the next few days and we'll advise the board uh, when that comes in. So we are in receipt of those funds. Um, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge our continued partnership with MassDOT. Um, we had reached out to them and requested that they um, consider replacing the imprint decorative uh, crosswalks across Route 9 um, in the Lakeway Business District. It's about a $350,000 project, and they are going to undertake that um, this um, summer construction season. So we're very grateful to Barry Lorian and, and his team uh, for helping us out with that project uh, on the state roadway. That's everything for the manager's report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? If not, if you could continue on under special reports, the coronavirus COVID-19 report from the town manager. Thank you. So it's uh, very fitting, and I'm very happy to report to the board that there have been no additional pos positive cases since the board met last. Uh, the last uh, day we had a positive case was June 7th, the day before your last meeting. Um, that's the first time we've gone a full meeting cycle since March 19th of last year with... Um, out having a case, so very pleased. I'm also happy to report that 24,290 Shrewsbury residents are fully vaccinated. That represents about 64% of the total population. Uh, so that's from you know age zero um, to our oldest resident, so that's more than eligible. Um, so it's, it's a strong number considering everyone's included in that. So very happy to be on that trajectory. Uh, town hall is back open uh, with uh, no mask mandate. We do ask uh, masks be worn if you're unvaccinated. That's the end of my COVID report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? If you could continue under financial business, the preliminary fiscal year 2021 closeout. Great. So we stand about seven days, uh, eight days prior to the end of the fiscal year. Uh, June 30th is the end of uh, our fiscal year. Just want to provide a brief report to the board uh, with regards to expenditures. We'll be going before the Finance Committee on Thursday evening and requesting um, several reserve fund transfers. Um, everyone will remember we were very austere with the budget for fiscal year 21, and that left a lot of uh, line items uncertain. And unfortunately, um, we're going to have to draw down upon most of the entire reserve fund uh, this year, which is not characteristic 
of, of how we uh, have budgeted in the past, but uh, certainly an impact of the situation that we were in last year at this time is we were still not even at town meeting and didn't <coughs> have it until August. So um, we'll have that meeting Thursday with the finance committee. Um, and then um, I also wanted to update the Board of Selectmen on uh, local receipts. Um, so we have um, received $11.3 million in local receipts. Uh, we're within um, almost ironically about $40,000 uh, from where what we had received uh, through 11 months of last fiscal year. Um, and that still remains to be about a million dollars, uh, $1.5 million less than we would have originally anticipated receiving. Um, so we're still quite far off on our revenues um, given the pandemic impacts. Um, we're within budget as, as I noted and we'll exceed our budget um, by the time we get through the end of June, but um, we're still off from our historic trend, which as we all know, challenged the fiscal year 22 budget process. and. We're looking for a strong economic recovery to bring those uh, receipt areas back to what we're used to. That's all I have. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll move on. It's not quite 710 yet, so I'll take the agenda items out of order before we have the 710 public hearing. Under new business, item number eight, we have the, our calendar for our meeting schedule from July through December 2021. What's the pleasure of the board? Do I have a, a motion or any comments or questions? Move approval of the proposed calendar. Second. Evan moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Um, go to item nine. I'm being daring here. It may take a few minutes. But the next item on the agenda is to review and act on speed and traffic concerns for Maple Avenue. This was originally brought up by Mr. DePaulo at our prior meeting asking the police department and department of public works to opine on uh, addressing concerns that residents had brought up with the speed on, on maple avenue and we received some commentary uh, some historical information from mr howland regarding a speed study that had been our speed observation i should say that had been done in the past uh, back in february 2020 and a significant majority of those cars had been driving within um, the, the speed limit that's currently posted we also received feedback from our subsequent feedback from him as well uh, in direct response and thoughts in getting a speed study from the Mass Department of Transportation as well as from Chief Anderson. Uh, Mr. Repetka also <coughs> chimed in. Um, our highway division manager had concurred with the statements from Mr. Howland and Chief Anderson in terms of their thoughts. Uh, Chief Anderson had also uh, provided an additional possible thought on um, looking to reduce the speed limit if um, it were thickly settled or business district and possibly looking at some of the speeds that way i think going from um, the police station uh, police station down towards Northboro, i think is what he was talking about and maybe it would not cover all areas but it would cover most of them um, so we have the information in front of us uh, didn't know what the pleasure of the board is regarding next steps mr DePaulo. <coughs> i think um I don't think the intent of the original request was to change the speed limit all the way from the center down to mm -hmm. North Pro. So I, I thought that was a little beyond, um, although they may have reasons why they, they wanted to do that. Um, I, I was curious and it wasn't clear in my mind if that speed study um, with the counters was done was that done before the crosswalks were put in or after? Before. Before. I think it, they can put it, they can put counters down without having to do an official go through the Correct. traffic. I'd just be curious to see if it, if it actually slowed down a little bit um, because of the crosswalks, which you would have hoped it did. Um, and then beyond that, we have a 25 mile an hour speed limit somewhere in the area of the post office. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I'm wondering if the state would look at that and extending it down to the town hall where you've got, what, three crosswalks and 200 feet. Um, 
But I, I understand how the how the uh, a full blown traffic study works and what we could end up with. But mm -hmm. um, I don't think we need to go there quite yet. Okay. Because um, I, I kind of assume that that's what we were going to find. But I, I do think there's. Um, I, I think there is reason for concern to have the crosswalk so close together um, where people have a 40 mile an hour speed limit and all of a sudden they come across three crosswalks. So um, if we could, if the manager could ask if we could at least look at that. Um, I know there was concern also about Old Mill and um, <coughs> Old Mill and um, Maple Ave, but um, it sounds like from what the feedback we got that um, nothing would change there. It actually could probably get the speed limit could change would be worse. Um, so, um, but anyways, if we could check town hall, but I'm just curious to see if they would take that into consideration. Yep. So, just the takeaways: one, uh, two things. Speed study again, if possible. Is that also just the count? Yeah, yeah, just put the counters down. Okay. And see and see right in this area if if there was any effect of those crosswalks okay. um, being here. And the other one is, if they, they've they already brought the speed limit down to 25 um, at the post office, mm -hmm. um, and understandably there's a lot more activity up there, but now that we have these crosswalks here, um, I just wonder if they would, they would consider looking at that. If I know they can do it, they can make changes in certain special exceptions. I know there's warrants they have to meet, but I, I don't think I, I, I think it would be a good idea to just take it to see explore every possibility and, and know what the answer is. So Mr. Mizakar, with the second step, would that be reaching out to the mass DOT to see if they're doing on a without the speed study and yep. extend it? Okay. How does that sound? Uh, members of the board, any does that work for everybody? Yeah. Um go ahead. just a quick comment. So I, I think that's a great plan for Maple Lab. Um, just in my own experience lately, I'm getting a lot of complaints about traffic and speed. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's never a really good answer um, to how we address concerns around people speeding. I think sometimes the perception is that they're driving higher than the speed limit. Many of our roads are unmarked, and I don't know that everyone is aware that a road that's unmarked is often a 40 mile an hour speed limit. So some just, just jotting down just quickly some of the roads that I've um, talked with residents about, Wilder Road, Prospect Street, Grove Street, Svenson Road, Old Mill Road. I, I'm wondering if it's possible or maybe it makes sense to have some sort of a workshop where we talk about traffic and maybe bring in the chief and highway <coughs> from DPW and sort of figure out what our approach is going to be because it's obviously a quality of life issue for people. I know that there's a lot more people out walking now because it seems to be something that's stuck with people since you know the pandemic. Um, and again, it may be that people are not driving any faster, but I know that there is an effect of having everybody's street be across New Street, as I've talked to the manager about. You know, ways or, or maps will send you through neighborhoods, uh, people trying to avoid lights, and it, I mean it's. If we're hearing about it this much, I think it's a pretty significant impact on enough people that it really does demand some more additional discussion and attention if possible. Okay, so we could schedule a workshop on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sounds good. Anything else? Okay, great. So we're past 710. Thanks for your patience. We'll come back to public hearing or 710 public hearing. <coughs> uh, it's a dog hearing in, uh, with Christina Tizano of 67 Worthington Ave, pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157. Um, so there's some procedural things, but before we get into that, I will entertain a motion to open the public hearing, and then from there I'll go through the procedural aspects. Move we open the public hearing. Second. I've been moved and seconded. Um, um, there being no question or comments, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. So now we're into our public hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to go through the process, and then we will um, take testimony from the various parties, which I'll outline now. Um, in terms of process, I'd ask that all questions come through me as the chair. And in terms of conduct, uh, understanding that sometimes these 
uh, proceedings by their very nature can be contentious. I'd ask that everyone remain courteous and respectful to each other, and all who want to speak will have an opportunity to do so. The Board of Selectmen has scheduled this dog hearing to take testimony and consider evidence to determine whether there is a dog owned or controlled by Christina Tizano, residing at 67 Worthington Avenue, Shrewsbury, Mass., 01545, which may be found to be a nuisance dog or a dangerous dog pursuant to Mass. General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157. The dog in question is Champ, number 2408, uh, presiding at 67 Worthington Avenue, Shrewsbury, Mass., 01545. The law requires that the Board of Selectmen investigate complaints of this nature and also requires us to conduct an examination of oath of the complainant. As such, I will ask that all of those who will testify be sworn in first. This includes those on all sides of this issue. I ask that all that wish to be heard on this matter to stand up at this time. I will ask that you remain standing so that I may swear you in as a group. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please state, I do. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. This is the order in which we will proceed. I will ask that the complainant testify first. That will be Mr. Brian LeBear. I will then ask that to hear the comments of the other witnesses. I will then allow Ms. Tizano, or her attorney, the opportunity to question the witnesses. I will then hear from our animal control officer, Keith Elms. I will then hear from the dog owner, Ms. Tizano, and or your attorney, if you wish. In all cases, any questions should be directed through me, as I previously mentioned. And as I mentioned, please remain courteous and respectful. You'll have an opportunity to be heard in this process. Once the questioning is concluded, I will then ask Ms. Tizano if she has any witnesses, and if so, we will hear their testimony. At the conclusion of that testimony, I will ask the board for a motion to close the hearing, which we just opened moments ago, and the board will go into a deliberation phase to make a finding. This will be done in open session, and a motion will be made by a member of the Board of Selectmen as to our findings. Those findings can be any of the following. There is no finding that the dog is either a nuisance or danger, is either a nuisance or dangerous, and the complaint is dismissed. The dog is deemed to be a nuisance or the dog is deemed to be dangerous. If the dog is found to be a nuisance, then I will ask the opinion of Dog Officer Keith Elms to make a recommendation to the board to mitigate the dog's behavior. If the dog is found to be dangerous, then there are a number of actions that may be taken, but I will reserve the right to discuss those options only should we get to that point. And now I will start the testimony uh, with Mr. LeBaire. If, um, if you could come up, please. Thank you. If you could sit down as well, please. It? Yes, please. If you could just uh, introduce yourself and your address, please. Hi, my name is Brian LeBear. I live at 218A South Quinsigamon Ave in Shrewsbury. First thing I want to say is this is the last thing we wanted to do. We didn't want any hard feelings against my mother's neighbors. We don't want, we just didn't want any trouble, but it basically came down to the, the, the health of my mother. Um, the dog has come after my mother before um, and snipped her in the butt, but she had dungarees on so it didn't break skin. It, you know, no big deal. We just let it go. No big deal. Two months ago, she was speaking with Christina's mother, who also lives at 67 Worthington Ave. Mm -hmm. And I believe one of the kids came out. I'm not sure how the dog got, but the dog came out of the storm door and directly at my mother. And Mary Ann, who is Christina's mother, was standing right there and tried to get in between them, but even she couldn't stop him. The dog viciously attacked my mother. Uh, one bite took eight stitches to close. One bite took three stitches to close. And she had black and blues all down her back from the dog jumping on her in the paws. Um, I felt like we did the right thing. We called the police. We called the control officer and let them do their thing. Um, we were hoping that the neighbors would do the right thing, um, but they didn't. Um, since then, I have talked to numerous people in the neighborhood who have all had trouble with the dog. Um, and 
I heard, which it's kind of hearsay because I didn't see it, but I have a neighbor who said they saw the dog out a few weeks back. I said, really? Oh, boy. Um, but then two weeks ago, my mother was out with the hose spraying the pollen off her car. Christina and her oldest, I think it was her oldest son, was sitting in their car in their driveway, which is no more than 100 feet from my mother's driveway. And the dog got out and beelined right towards my mother. Thank God she had that hose in her hand. She sprayed the hose at the dog, which deterred him for a little bit. My 80-year-old mother ran like a little kid for the garage and closed the door and sat there crying because this dog is literally going to attack her again. Mm -hmm. um, I cut her lawn every week for the last many, many years, and they have a wooden fence fenced in backyard. And the, the fence is kind of falling apart in his spaces, and when I drive along the side of that fence, that dog is, you know, there's one spot where the, the fence was leaned out, his teeth and his jaw, and he is barking and gr I mean, he's literally a foot from my, and I'm like, I mean, he, he's, he's scary. He's very scary. Um, I just think if something's not done, he is going to get my mother again. My mother's been living there for 58 years. 58 years she's been living in that house. Her mailbox is no more than 20 feet from her front door. Every day, she has to go to the side window, check the yard, go to the front window, check the yard, open the front door, look both ways, see if she hears anything, and then she runs like a little kid, gets her meal and runs back in the house. She can't even go out and water her flowers because she's scared. I mean, this is no way for somebody to live. And I, I'm, I'm upset that they haven't done anything and they forced us to do this to make us, now, we, now I feel like the bad guy, but something has to be done. Um, that's, that's, I mean, even after the first attack where my mother got stitches and everything, the control officer had them had the dog under quarantine, which I thought they took, when he said quarantine, I was thinking they were going to take the dog for a little bit. No, quarantine is at their house, which I wasn't comfortable with because they got kids, and I'm not blaming them. The kids are kids. They open the door, the dog gets out. You know, it just, and I'm sure the control ops can tell you what happened, but I heard, like, the seventh day of this, quarantine, he went over to make sure that they were doing what they were asking, you know, tied up. And the dog bit the dog officer. I mean, I don't know how much more needs to be done before. I mean, we're going to wait till my mother is maimed before something is done? I'm just, I'm just very scared of my mother. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? If you could just sit for one second, just have an opportunity for questions. Okay. I'll open that up now. Um, to board members, any questions? No? Not yet. Can I just ask one quick question? On the couple instances in question when the dog attacked, is it dog just going straight? Is the dog barking? Is the dog making noise? Is it is that happening? Is it? He is barking and growling at me at all times, all day long, from the backyard, from the, from the bed there, bedroom, or just at me, and I don't know why. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Thank you. Any other questions at all? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, Mr. LeBeau. So, in your interactions uh, with the with the dog owner um, after the, the time your mother was bit, uh, did they did they offer you any action that they were voluntarily going to take? Um, we've heard from the control officer. Um, there was one time my mother was out. You know, after the attack, and she was in the backyard with the flowers, and the dog was like against the fence, like. And Marianne, who was the mother of Christina, said, "Don't worry, Sybil, we got him." And my mother said, "Are you going to get rid of that dog because he is going to get me again?" And then we never heard anything after that. Thank you. Anything else, um, Mr. LeBear? Any additional witnesses at all that you'd like to call? Um. I mean, my brother, I mean, uh, my brother, yeah, I, don't think I think I pretty much told okay. the story. That's, that's the okay. story. That's the, okay. They, they the ones who had to go to my mother's house every day and wrap her arm and unwrap it and clean it. And, you know, it's just no way for an 80-year-old woman to live. It's just not. She has no defense against a 100-pound German Shepherd. Okay. 
Thank you. So before I, next, before I allow Ms. Tizano or her attorney an opportunity to question, just want to read a couple documents into the record that were referenced during the presentation. Um, the initial hearing request um, that was by email dated June 8th, 2021. We have the April 14th, 2021. Um, actually, it's dated April 16th, um, but it's for the 14th uh, of the bite. The uh, animal bite report. We have the narrative report from the um, animal control officer dated June 17th, 2021. We also have a copy of the police uh, incident report and um, there's related uh, in uh, information to that incident report. And finally, um, we also have a copy of CHAMP's license tag number 2408. So that's just was referenced during the testimony there and just wanted to read that into the record. Uh, next step on this is originally discussed as an opportunity for uh, Ms. Tizano or her attorney to ask any questions. Please proceed. Come on forward. Thank I don't you. Know if you want to see pictures of what the dog did to my mother? Um, sure. Uh, yes. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Christina Tizano. I'm the dog owner of Champ Tizano. Um, I've had him since he was eight weeks old. Mm -hmm. um, he lives at home with um, my five children, who range from 12 to three years old. My husband and I, um, Champ, just turned two on May 22nd. And prior to this altercation that happened, the situation with Mrs. LeBear, um, in April, I have never had a complaint on my dog ever. Um, I have witnesses within my neighborhood as well that um, have taken care of our do my dog um, when uh, I've gone on vacation. But um, prior to the situation that happened um, when the dog bit Mrs. LeBear, I unfortunately was not there. Um, my mom and Mrs. LeBear were talking. I've also lived um, at 67 Worthington Ave for my whole life. So Mrs. LeBear has been my neighbor for my whole life, 34 years. Mm -hmm. And um, her safety is a concern for me too. Um, I've always checked in on her and um, we've given her sent dinners over there to her and we care about her mm -hmm. a lot. And um, this is the first dog that I've ever owned, mm -hmm. and I've never dealt with a situation like this before. So um, Keith, the dog officer, has been a huge help to me, mm -hmm. and um, we've worked hand in hand. Uh, he has given me a crate. Um, <coughs> I have pictures here um, just to show you, so it's not just a say, mm -hmm. um, that my dog is on a 200-foot runner in our backyard. I have a muzzle for him. Um, he did have uh, a situation with the dog officer that Keith and I both have talked about because mm -hmm. it's a first situation for me as well. And um, Keith said, you know, like, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I didn't, we, we just weren't thinking. And I, I never thought that he would try to, you know, be unfriendly with him, but he was. And so I uh, installed an electric fence on my yard. And if, if I may just interrupt for one. So do you have any questions, though? at all for? Um, I don't really have any questions. I okay. just, um, everything that Keith suggested that I did, um, I have taken seriously and wholeheartedly. Okay. And I, all of his suggestions, I've, I've, I've done. Okay, so for the record, there are no questions um, to the complainant at this point. And we'll just, at this point, we'll move it around and we'll just have you continue with what you were talking about. Okay. Um, so I just have some pictures here um, of the dog in the backyard. So um, prior to the situation, I guess the dog was um, at the side of the fence where Mrs. LeBear lives. Mm -hmm. And she never had brought it to my attention that she was afraid. And then like after all of this bite happened and all of this stuff, um, came to surface. Uh, she had been telling me that he had been going onto the side of the fence and he um, was making her feel really nervous and I didn't want her to feel uncomfortable. I mean, she, she lives there and I need her to be comfortable where she lives. So I moved the dog to the left side of our gazebo. So he has a whole, um, you know, a whole range 
you know, on the other side that's just as lengthy as, you know, the right side. So um, I have a muzzle for him. He's constantly leashed. Um, and I also have the crate that Keith, that Keith, um, I have uh, my electric, my electric fence, and I also somewhere around here have the crate that Keith, um, that Keith had given me. And I use all of, um, I use everything. Um, you know, it makes it just, you know, it makes me nervous too that my dog's going to be taken away from me, and it's not what I want. Right now, it's just a hearing. We're just taking facts, and we haven't got to that point yet. Um, anything else, or board members, any questions for Mr. Zano? Mr. Mr. DiPaolo. Um, so you say the dog has a muzzle, but in the reports that, or the report we got from, you know, a control officer, we weren't using it because the dog was resisting it? Um, I actually got a new one. Okay, so using a muzzle now? Um, I haven't taken him for a walk or anything outside, so I haven't used it. I wasn't sure if they were going to recommend that I used it um, when he goes into the backyard, um, I guess. Okay, so he hasn't been out of the backyard? No, he has not. Okay. Um, what about training? Did you talk to? Um, I have. I have spoke to um, my vet had recommended um, uh, um, a trainer. Bob Clark, um, I have taken some, he, he's from Millbury, and I have um, taken some ch suggestions mm -hmm. from him, but it's just a little expensive. I'm taking my children on a 10-day vacation next <coughs> week, and it's expensive, but. What are you gonna do with the dog over the next 10 days? My mom's gonna take care of him. My parents, they you live upstairs. Do you feel upstairs. comfortable that they can control the dog? Yes, I do. You strain it? If Sorry. They need to. What was it? Well, if the dog gets active, you be able to physically restrain it. Um, I don't think that my mom will take him for a walk or anything like that. I think. No, it, but even in the backyard. In, yes, she. she mm -hmm. Did Did I read in here that? Or did you say you have the dog on a on a run? Yep, he's on a two hundred foot runner in the backyard. Okay. So I actually just like to prevent any problems. I actually just leash him when I even take him outside. I have a bad hip, so I can't really walk him anyways. But um, I leash him when I take him out to our backyard and I put him from one leash to another. So I put him from the leash to the runner. And then when I get him to bring him inside, I put him on the leash and then I just take it off in the house. Um. How, how long is the dog out during um, the day? Is he out all day? He no. In and out? No. He, he won't it's okay stay. when the weather's nice if he's out. I, I know, but he won't stay outside very long without me, so he's barking his head off. So I try to leave him out there for a little while just to get some fresh air, but mm -hmm. he doesn't really want to be away from me, so. Okay. All right. Any other Thank questions? You. This Excellent. is Gasavan. Um, so the things that you were showing us and telling us about, mm -hmm. when did you start implementing? I started doing this immediately after I started working with the dog officer, and the dog has taken to the restrictions very, very well. He is a dog that is um, recommended a prescription um, for anxiety. He is a little hyper. He just turned two, and um, he has really kind of... Okay, done right. well with the restrictions that I've given him because I think that like the crate and things like that are like a safe net for him as well. So everything that I've done isn't just for the safety of like my neighbors and my neighborhood. It's also for the safety of my dog as well. Um, one more question, if no, I may. No, please go ahead. So explain to me then if you're t you're telling me that you're taking the dog like on a leash outside mm -hmm. and then putting him on another leash and then bring. But how how did it happen that the dog got loose? to bite the first place? Was it, you oh, weren't so doing that originally? Or? Oh, um, to when the, when the, when when the, the bite, bite first happened, happened in yes. April, mm -hmm. um, I have a three-year-old and I was in the house with her and we were using the bathroom and my four-year-old son left the door open and um, the dog went running out and my mom was concerned that the dog was gonna jump on Mrs. LeBaire because he's, he's 
a puppy, he jumps. And she grabbed Mrs. LeBear and she started going around in a circle with her, screaming, champ, champ, champ. And my dog thought he was protecting my mom and that's why he bit Mrs. LeBear. I wasn't there, but that is what we have all talked about. So I guess then my concern is making sure that that situation doesn't repeat itself because kids are unpredictable and they open doors. And how do we make sure that, you know, what have you put into place to make sure that, that the dog can't get out if you aren't able to be there to monitor the situation? So I have the electric fence now on my property and I also have him on a 200 foot runner. But that's in the backyard, right? He doesn't go in the front yard. Okay, so you're saying you went out the back door and bit Mrs. LeBear. He, so I'm just, I guess I just don't understand. Okay, so we, so, so we, I have a front door, mm -hmm. but we, ever since the situation, we do not use the front door anymore. That's what I was asking. Yeah, so okay. we do not use the front door anymore. The kids don't even, they're not even allowed to play in the front yard anymore. Ever since this situation happened in April, that has just stopped completely. Kids go in the backyard and they, we don't even use our front door. It's bolted locked. And, um, sorry, so. That's it. You answered my question. Thank okay. you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. What was that? Yeah. This is fun. Go ahead. So the incident on June 7th, yes. um, can you just clarify the electric fence? Is that in the front yard? It is. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I actually, so I actually was not present. So it was just my husband and, um, my son, Anthony, who was there. I wasn't there. So my son was in the car. We were. Um, bringing in our groceries, and he got out the back door. So he got out the back door. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so he got out the back door. Mrs. LeBear was watering um, her flowers, and she sprayed him with the hose, um, and he just, you know, he didn't do anything. He, they, my son said stop, and my husband grabbed him, and they brought, I mean, they brought him in. Um, but How cl Was he able to, so she to was reach on, her if he wanted to? So she was on her property, and she sprayed him with a hose from a, a distance. And those were my son's words. Your four-year-old son? No, nope, he's 12. 12-year-old 12 son. If the dog got out the back, yes. could the dog leave the backyard and go into your neighbor's yard? Not now, because I have an electric fence. Not now, but on June 7th? No. Okay. So, so ever since the altercation happened in April, I have had an electric fence on my, in my property. So the dog has not left my property. I've never had another neighbor complaint about my dog ever. I've had the dog for almost two years. My, I've never heard my dog growl. I've never heard my dog bark. He is hyper and he's on a prescription because he has anxiety. So when people walk by, he's a dog. He barks and, and you know, he... He gets hyper and he jumps up and he, you know, wants to go and play. But I've never had a complaint about him. Well, there, there, there is a complaint on June seventh that he approached your neighbor again, and I'm just trying to understand if he could have reached her in no, that situation. He could not. Okay. Thank you. Mr. DePaul, um, I just want to follow up. Did you say the electric fence was in the front yard? Yes, the electric fence is in the front yard. I have a, I the entire have a, yard or just the front yard? I have a, um, I have a fenced-in backyard. So the, I have a completely fenced-in backyard. So he has like range in motion in our backyard, but um, in the front yard is really where I'm like preventing, trying to prevent him to, from running. So it's just in my front yard. So it's when you, so when you walk out of the gate, that's when the Beeping starts. Can you walk out of the gate off the property? Or it's which still my gate? property because it's my driveway. So it's still my property. So as soon as he walks out of the back gate, we change the distance on the electric fence that as soon as he starts walking out of the back gate, it starts beeping. And now we have a range of motion that is in our front yard that um, is just from the front door to the, because it, it goes in a 90 degree angle. Okay. <clears throat> so um, it's not in the backyard, it's I, just in the front yard. Typically an electric fence, dog is trained that if he goes, or she goes in, within so many feet of where the actual wire is for the fence, the sound starts to go off. Yes. Not 
when he gets to the fence. It, it's like a pre-warning, like did you put the flags up ahead of time? So, so that the dog understands when it went past that, they learn when they go past those we're, flags. We're learning. What? We're, we're, yes, we're lear yes, we're learning. But we're did le you do that? Yes, we're doing that. Okay. Still doing that. Okay, so it's there. It's there. Okay. Um, one of the problems, just, just so you're aware, a big dog like that, and, and I know because I have family have big dogs like that, not shepherds, but if that dog is excited, it, it's not unusual for a dog that's hyper mm -hmm. to go right through if they get excited. They won't come back in because then they realize they're going to get zapped again, but in their excitement, they will, they will run out, so just be aware of that. Yeah, the dog, um, dog can <clears throat> tell me that too. But I have a question more specifically about the dog having anxiety. <clears throat> um, and I, I, there are dogs like that. I understand that. Um, but has anything been done to try to, it, it sounds almost like a mental health issue, but find out why this dog is like this? Why is it anxious? Is it, is it afraid? Um, what's causing the anxiety? Anxiety isn't just anxiety. There's some reason that dog is nervous about something, anxious, just like people. Mm -hmm. So I understand you're giving it the medication, but what, what, what's causing it? Did the vet just say, well, the dog has anxiety? I mean, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really tell you much. It doesn't tell you what, if the dog's reacting to something. Well, what did the vet say? Well, um, he had originally asked me if, when we left, if he had, like, separation anxiety and he would, like, tear the trash apart, and he would do that, yes. Okay. And um, I'm assuming that the kids probably have a little bit to do with it. I mean, we have five kids. But, okay, but it would seem that if he was concerned about the kids, he'd let the kids know it. If the dog was concerned about the kids and they were bugging him, he'd let them know it one way or another. So, but it, it sounds like you're saying when when if when he was outside, if he's aware of somebody walking by, he he barks, which is fine. Dogs do that. My dog does that. Doesn't mean he runs out in the yard. I understand that. But is he running out and trying to get at the people, or running back and forth at the yard? Like, you know, shepherds are pretty protective. Yeah, um, sorry, so is he know. trying to protect the property, um, or is he wanting to say hello? I mean, th there's different reasons dogs do that, but, but the anxiety part of it, if, if he has a situation that he needs some medication to calm him down, there's something, there's something that's causing that anxiety. And I guess the real point of my question is, so have you, have you actually taken him to someone a, a trainer or whatever to try to figure out what his triggers are? Um, no, I guess I didn't think about that until you just asked. So it's something that I... Well, the dog is two years old. If the dog's anxious. I mean, Shepard's lived for, what, 12, 13 years? I mean, you're going to deal with that for 12 or 13 years and, I mean, not understand what's setting him off? And, um, a, a little bit, I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, um, Right, the right word is kind of like telling you what to do, but it would seem like you'd want to find out if you could do something to get the dog to calm down. I mean, shepherds are protective. If if mm -hmm. if the kids were around and the dog was doing that, I think it it's more explainable than the dog just being anxious and being agitated when it sees people out in the street or next door. So, you know, it it just seems like you. It's, you should be doing something with that. Try to figure out what's going on so you can address it. Um, otherwise, you know, who knows what's going to happen at the end of this hearing, but, I mean, that dog's not going to change if you don't do something to modify his behavior. So, I guess just a word of caution. Any, any other questions? I have a few, but before so, Mr. Mizikar, you had a question. I was wondering if you could just describe for the board um, how you've trained the dog with regards to the electric fence. So we just started doing this. So um, he's on a leash, and um, my neighbor's helping me because I'm just, like, a little nervous about this whole entire situation. And um, we have the collar on him, and we have the flags, 
and um, when he, we hear the beeping, we just say no, and then we pull him back. And just we've just been continuing to do that. Um, I was joking yesterday, and um, I was saying to my neighbor that I was. I said they know that he knows that they want to take him over. <laughs> take him away from me because I was trying to get him to come into the front yard with me and um, he like pulls back and he's been doing that for like a little while just probably because he doesn't want to go into the car but um, I did get him out there today I did we did do a little bit of the you know um, on the leash we did you know put the collar on and do the no and then go back out he'll hear the beeping we pull him back in and say no so I'm just hoping that he'll just, we'll just continue on just keeping him on the runner and, you know, just doing like the leash from the runner to the leash from the, to the runner um, going forward so we don't have to go through this anymore. Just one more question. Sure, Mr. Yeah. Just, Mr. Uh, does, does the dog wear the electric fence collar all the time? Um, like when you're taking him out to the backyard to put him on the run, no. does he have the... Okay. <clears throat> but I'm wondering if I should do that. Okay. Um, I'm also wondering if we can like compromise and I can like always keep the muzzle on him. Um, I just, you know, I just don't know what kind of life that is for him either, you know? Like having to go outside with the muzzle on all the time. Like he's not a bad dog. It's just an unfortunate circumstance. So, Ms. Tizano, I have a few questions. Thank you. And then um, I'll see if there are any other questions, and then I'll ask the complainant an opportunity as well. And I understand you had some pictures, and I'll also give uh, the complainant an opportunity to present the pictures as well. Um, has the dog ever barked at your children? No. Any family members? No. The backyard, we had testimony earlier that it may not be of the best structural integrity. How, how, is the, how old is the fence, the backyard fence? Is it new? Is it? Are there holes in it? Are there my, holes? Dad, my dad would have to answer that question. I'm not entirely sure. So let me ask it differently. Is it solid? Is it, are any part, are there gaps? Are there rotted wood? Is it structurally I mean, sound? Um, my, my dad, my father and my husband have, you know, gone around the backyard and like they have, you know, fixed, fixed the fence mm -hmm. um, on the places that are or have been falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's like a completely different situation with like one side of the neighborhood as far as like the property line goes. So I'm like not entirely sure about um, the fence that's on um, 67 and 68 or whatever. I, I, I don't really know the side of the fence that's on Mrs. LeBear's side. Um, I'm, I, I can't answer that, I don't know. Is that know. your fence? Or is it, so is that all of your fence or that's your fence? I okay. Answer. My parents bought land in the back. We had to have it surveyed. We found out that their fence is on their property. We went to them and you, I don't even want to explain to what happened. The words they yelled at my mother and father and all that that started. Uh, that's that's just, we, just, stay with the, just let you know. So I don't know. I'm not we've entirely asked them sure. So if you could just identify yourself. Hi, my name is Stephen Mancini. I'm the owner of the house, and I'm also Christina's father. That fence that's um, in question, yeah. the fence has been replaced a few times. Um, my son-in-law, Rudy, and I, I think maybe last year, we replaced eight sections, and we're gradually going around the yard to replace the ones that really need to be replaced. The ones that affect the LaBeers, mm -hmm. we've replaced numerous times. And just from the land settling, some of the fence kind of separates. <clears throat> so you do have a gap between the post and the um, fence, but uh, not enough for the dog to get through. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, just to the dog, on the, the understand the dog's on medication. Is the dog still taking Prozac? Yes, he does. Is the dog, has there been any noticeable difference in the dog's behavior since taking Prozac? Yes, there has. How so? He's just a little bit calmer. Okay. Uh, then the last question I have, and then I'll turn it over to So understanding that the dog in the latest incident got out the back door because one of the younger children kept the door 
opened. Mm -hmm. How would that be prevented going forward from happening, understanding that the fence may have some slight gaps, pretty big dog, I'll get to the last question I have, but how would that stop from not, ha how could that not happen again? Because understanding kids are kids, so the last thing you're thinking about is letting the dog <coughs> out. How would that be prevented? Well, I've had to have the conversation with the kids about, you know, opening and closing the door and making sure that it's properly closed so that these situations don't happen. I had to be honest with them so that they knew what was happening, you know, and what was what we were, you know, dealing with so that they could be aware as to, like, why I'm always, like, yelling, like, we have to keep the door closed. We have to keep the door closed. We can't use the front door. We, you know, like, I'm just, I'm just constantly just stressing over this whole situation. So... Just taking matters into my own hands, you know, and just staying on top of it as best as, as best as I can, you know. How many pounds does a dog weigh? He weighs 100 pounds. It's like I, th I think it's like yeah, it's like 98 pounds. Or Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Laveau. Thank you. Um, you would. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. Mm -hmm. The dog was taking medication prior to the the first biting incident? No, he was not. Okay, so the, it's something did you approach the vet because of the incident? So it's actually something that the dog, uh, the, um, the vet and I have discussed before and after the whole situation with Mrs. LeBaire, I, we talked about it again and I just said like maybe it was a good idea just to like keep him a little less like hyper. He's just, he's a, he's a puppy and he's hyper. And have you had opportunity to uh, opportunity to kind of review the situation and determine if the if the dose dosage needs to be adjusted at all? Is there um, any he's, consideration to that? Um, he's handled the med he's been doing well on the on the medication since April since the situation that has happened. So I really haven't had any um, any like further conversations with him about it. And how would you how explain to us a little in more detail, please, how the dog is better now that it takes the medication? Um, so he just like used to pant a lot. He would um, like pant, and I'm just like noticing that he doesn't breathe as heavily. Heavily, and um, I don't know. He he just relaxes, I guess. And how about the dog's behavior? Just watching people walk by. Like out the window. So like today we had our pool open and he wasn't like, you know, up on the windows barking or anything like that. He did at first when they first came to the house to open the pool. But um, I've just been just trying to work with him. Like, it's okay, boy, you know, like just talking to him. But he didn't like go crazy. He wasn't like running around and jumping on the, um, jumping on the windows to try to, you know, get outside. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Flynn. Just to clarify on the electric fence, yes. do you have examples of the electric fence actually working? You're training the dog on the electric fence, but has your dog gotten loose and has the electric fence been proven to stop the dog? No. And so, he's, so I don't think that he's ever been, like, zapped by the collar but I don't know for sure like I, no so he, I don't believe that he's been zapped by the collar if this situation were reversed and this happened to one of your children by a neighbor's dog what how can you demonstrate the reassurance that the na your neighbors are safe that this would not happen again well ever since all of this happened i have taken into consideration all of the suggestions that he has given to me which he told me weren't mandatory but i took them seriously and wholeheartedly and that's why i got the runner for him prior to this situation he never had a runner he never had a muzzle he never had a crate i never had an electric fence and i got all of those things to prevent any other situation from happening because I want Mrs. LeBaire to be safe, like, in our neighborhood. She's been my neighbor for my whole life. Like, I care about her safety. I could completely understand if, you know, like, the dog was going out and, you know, he was just running all over the neighborhood and I wasn't taking this seriously. This is a serious situation for me. Any other final questions? So, no? 
Mr. Uh, Mr. DePaulo, go ahead. Who, who instructed you on how to use the electric fence? I called the containment system, and okay. they walked me through it. And they told you not to let the dog cross the line, keep pulling it back? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they I, have, I, I have no dog expert, but I have never heard that you keep pulling the dog back so it doesn't experience it. That's the whole point of it. Um, if you're not letting the dog get zapped, it doesn't know that it's not supposed to cross that line. If you're not letting it get that close. I'm not saying you should zap them. I'm just saying that's the way well, they typically work. That's why I keep work. pulling them back because I don't... I'm... Well, we can ask the animal control officer, but um, I, I don't think you're training the dog right with that electric fence. You think I should zap them? Well, no, you do what you want with your dog, but if the dog doesn't know that there's a consequence to going over near that fence, it's not going to go It's not Well, I'm go hoping that the beeping, the he'll, get to the, he'll, he'll hear the beeping. The beep is to warn him that he's going to get zapped. So we can ask the animal control officer after, but um, I think you are getting trained to keep the dog away from the fence more than the dog is being trained to, oh, seriously, to, to, to stay away from the fence. You can ask the animal control officer after. Mrs. Casaban. Did you have a company install the electric fence? No. Who installed the electric it's fence? It's a wireless, um, it's a wireless containment center uh, system. So he has the collar and then there's like a distance and then there's like a high voltage. So it goes in like a, um, it goes in a, a radius yep. around the property. So when they, when, um, so is it on your Wi-Fi? No, it's on like a, it's on a, a um, this is it. It's like a, it's a, it's like a machine. So like he come, he, this is the collar. So like this is the collar and like this is the collar that's on him and like this is what the system looks like. And this is what the, and so like I just have the system in like my front window, so it's like on, and then the flags are what determines like whether or not like where he can go, but. Um, All right, so the reason that I asked is because I just, I thought, I was under the impression that when you got an electric fence that you used an electric fence company and that, that came with the person who installed the fence and then taught the, you and the dog how the system worked. Like I thought it came with training. So I guess I'm just not familiar with that system. Because it seems like you installed something, but you have to figure out yourself how to train the dog. Whereas I thought it was part of the, and I think that's what Mr. DePaulo was kind of getting at, is usually when you contract with an electric fence company, they come out and install the fence, and then they teach you how to, how to proceed. Oh, no, I didn't have anybody come and install it. Okay. Any other questions? So you had mentioned that here's where we're going to go from here because we get a little out of order. You had mentioned you have pictures that you wanted to introduce um, if you want to do that then we'll provide the complainant an opportunity to ask any questions that he has uh, and then we'll give the complainant an opportunity to introduce pictures we got a little out of order so we'll allow that as well and then we'll go to the animal control officer for his testimony after that so Mr. Zana, do you have pictures that you wanted to introduce? Yeah, I do. I don't have pictures of the, the crate that Keith gave me. I think that those might have... And if you could explain them as we go through and we'll introduce them to the record and make part of the record. Do you want me to come up? Yeah, if you could just sure, I can present keep. these pictures we can keep or at least make copies of them and then return so we can have them for the record. Of course. So this is just his muzzle. So... Okay. And this is just to him like on his leash. So it's a 200... Um, it's a 200 foot leash um, or runner, so it goes on this. Um, it's on the left side of my property. What's he attached to? He's attached to the. So see back here. He's attached to a tree. Oh, he's attached to a tree. Okay. And then that's the um, that's the system that I have. But I mean. So just for the record, we have four pictures that are being introduced. Mm -hmm. If you would mind, so this is fine. You have. The, the muzzle, the leash, what yeah. are the others? I don't yeah. know if they were picked up. Want me? Um, here's his and is this line. just to show evidence? So is the muzzle, how often is that worn? So I, so. He had, I didn't, he didn't, if I remember from the record, he didn't really like no. the, okay. So I haven't taken him for a walk or anything, so he hasn't, I really haven't put the muzzle on him. Um, but I mean, it's, it's 
Okay. That's so have to do. I mean, muzzle, I'm sorry. So this is the wireless. Is the wireless system that this is part of, is this plugged into a power supply? Is there yes, a backup is. supply? Is it just yeah. a regular plug? It is. Okay. And then this is just pictures of the dog. Okay. Any, and I'll pass this down, see if there are any questions with oh, that. Here, though, so this is where he's attached to the tree. And then they have the record the for the complaint. I don't know if you want to look at those pictures as part of your questions back. Okay. Okay, yeah. so thank you for these. So at this point, are there any, go ahead, Mr. DeBolle. I just need to ask a follow-up question to make Please sure do. I understand the, um, make sure I understand that, um, um, the wireless fence. So what I think I'm hearing is there is no wire in the ground on the perimeter of the property, right? No. Okay, it's a, a so this is emitting a signal in like a radius? Right. Okay. So the radius is really only in the front yard to determine that he doesn't go, he doesn't leave the property, I guess. So how do you control how big the radius is? There's a... You get, you get an adjustment on it? Yeah, there's an adjustment on it. So you have to learn where the edge of the radius well, is. Well, we already did all that. Oh, no, I'm just saying, you need to learn, when you, when you use it, you need to understand where the edge of the radius is so you can train the dog, Right. Right. Okay, and so is that what you were saying that you would pull the dog yes. back? Yes. Okay. All right, now I understand. Okay. Because like, with a wire fence, it's a little different. You see, you got the thing, and um, it's a little different than what you're using. Which, okay, that's fine, so as long as I understand it. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? So, uh, for the record, the complainant's been an, given an opportunity to review the pictures, has declined to do so, but at this time, you have, Mr. Robert, you have an opportunity to ask any questions of Ms. Tizano at this point, if you'd like. Not required to, but if you have any questions, you may ask them at this time. Any, Go ahead. any questions at all for oh, Ms. Tizano? Just I'm just confused about June 7th where all this stuff was done after the initial attack. Mm -hmm. um, how did the dog get into my mother's yard and come after her? He did it. A week ago. Well, yeah, well, on the 7th. It had to go through both sides of the electric uh, Excuse me. Excuse me. Yard. If we could just go through the chair. Yeah. Um, go with Mr. LeBear, if we could, through the chair, and then we'll ask Ms. Tizano through me. I don't know if I'm the best one to do this because I wasn't there. My mother was there. I'm just well, we going can, by what she said, the dog came after her, and she said if she didn't have that hose, she would have been attacked again. She ran for her garage and closed the garage door. Now, we have the opportunity to give testimony as well. Could you, you've been sworn in, you raised your hand during that, so if you could provide, for the record, if you could just, so helpful with the question on that, you have the direct knowledge related to that. So if you could just, for the record, Identify yourself, please. When he was a puppy, he used to come and sit in my yard with my husband and I. My husband was sick, and he'd swing, mm -hmm. and the puppy was right at his feet. He, lo he liked my husband and I. Um, but he just, I don't know why. Well, from the fence, there's a staircase going to the second floor. He sits on that, and he barks at everybody goes by, and he barks at me. If I go out with a rake or my wheelbell, he's barking and scratching on the fence to try to get me. That's how I feel about it. So, and um, I was out. But just the other thing, mm -hmm. the whole spraying was just a week ago. Mm -hmm. I think it was last sun, a week ago Sunday. So just so I understand on the question, and, and if you could, for the record, is it, is it um, Mrs. LeBear, is it Sybil LeBear? Sybil, yeah. Okay, so for the record that Sybil LeBear, who had been sworn in earlier, is just providing some testimony related to a question. Yeah. Is the question how, in this latest instance, did the dog get out? Is that the question? Yeah, how did my mother have to spray or what? <laughs> I mean, I saw her get in the car with her older son, you know, and I was, I had watered flowers and, and I, oh, I'll get some of that dust off my car right in front of my mm -hmm. house. And I heard noise and he was coming right at me and I saw her son jump out of the car and he looked like he was going to head to me, but instead he went in the house and yelled to his father. So, of course, his father come running out. But as he come at me, I sprayed the water. And 
He must have been in the house for a while. He had to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. He ran over um, through right by me I, when I sprayed him, and he went that way. I ran like heck in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and he went to the bathroom right there. So he probably had to get out to go to the bathroom. Okay, so is the question just asking clarification how in the second time he got out of the house? Or just it's more of a tour? He just came out the front door. Somebody okay. might have, must have opened it and well, out. Just for the record. Uh, it's not the front, front door. I think earlier testimony you heard from the oh. back door. Just out of clarification that. Yeah, the front door is bolted shut. The front door is not used. It's never used. Since I wasn't when, yeah. there. I wasn't there for this particular situation. So this is the second instance that yes. was referenced in the record. I don't know where the, he came from, but she but was in the this, car and so she was going somewhere with her son. Testimony no, has I been wasn't in the car. Out I was of the, in the house. I when you were watching your me, just place. guys, just, just to keep this. So if I if I understood so far, is that the second instance the dog escaped through the back door? Is that right. correct? Yes. And where the back door there's not the electric fence. But the fence itself. No, the back. No, the uh, back door now has the electric. The back door now has the electric fence. But I'm um, sorry. But the back door did not. No, the back door. Do, no, the back door does. So it's from the back door all the way to the front of the yard at a ninety degree radius. So that the so the dog can go to the front yard. Okay. Okay. The, okay. So. So he can go in the backyard without being shocked. I understood. Yeah. So, so if, but then when he goes, when the the collar starts beeping, when he starts leaving the back the back uh, gate. Okay. So it's I'm not 100 percent clear now. Me either. How the dog came out, but I think that's the question. And I think it's been asked. We've had some thoughts how it's been answered, so but we dog? have the evidence in front of us, Mr. DePaulo. I'm I'm still not clear. Mrs. Levere, the second time, was the dog out of his yard no. when, when you sprayed it? Was yes, it, it was in my yard. The second time. What do you mean second? You, she was spraying. Well, she was. Yeah, the first time you got, you got attacked and you got bitten. I got bit. Okay. That was the second time. There was three times, okay. and that was the, like okay. the fourth right. time. The time you sprayed it with the hose, which I think was the last time. Yeah, correct? it was a week and a half ago. Was the dog in its yard? Or was the dog out in, in your yard? He was in my yard. It he was came out yard. of their yard somehow. Okay. I don't know. Okay, so it was not on their property, that's what you're saying? They he got off he came out and he headed right for me. Okay. And but he was in and my he was, yard. He was in your okay, thank that's you. That's when the, okay. when his, her okay. husband came to grab him. Okay. And as his husband came, of course, then he ran down the street. He, thank you. you know, thank he had you. to chase him down the street. Thank you. Any further questions for the complaint? From well, the complaint? Like I say, the first time, he got me in the back. And she was talking to me, and he ran so fast, I don't think he could stop. And he powed right into my back. So, of course, I was, had a bad back for a while. Mm -hmm. um, the next time, it was, um, I don't know if that's the time I got, I got really hurt, and I had all the stitches, and it's two months ago, and it still hurts. Mm -hmm. and, and then one day, I was in the backyard, and he came, he got out and he came, but her 12 year old son come and he was like a um, hockey um, goalie trying to keep the dog away from me. Dog didn't even have a collar on, the kid couldn't, couldn't even grab him to get a, I'm scared stiff, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but he was like a goalie right in front of me and he kept, kept the dog away from me. Because okay. then I just go in the house. So now I'm just afraid to go out. Okay, thank and you. this was just a week ago, week and a half ago that he came into my yard. Thank you. I didn't know anything about a electric fence. But that staircase going up to the grandmother's house, mm -hmm. he sits there and he barks. I could come out with a wheelbarrow, no matter what I did, he barked. And then I went out one day and I started cleaning against the fence, mm -hmm. a lot of weeds and stuff. My husband was sick, I hadn't gotten out there. Mm -hmm. Didn't even open my mouth. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I heard him running and barking and he's on the fence trying to get mm -hmm. me. And that's when they said, don't worry, we got him. I am worried. I know he's going to get me again. Now, especially school's out, and I feel bad. I feel bad for him now. He's two years old, and they got him tied up. He's crying and whining and barking. He don't like it. I don't blame him. He don't like it over there. Okay. Thank you. It's sad. So, thank you, Mrs. LeBaire. So, Mr. LeBaire, you had mentioned you had some pictures. Did you want to share? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Holly. My daughter-in-law. Okay. I had 
was uh, just the person who was taking pictures. Um, I, I was doing it to make sure that it wasn't getting, there was no infection coming, it wasn't uh -huh. getting worse. So I have a progression of pictures, mm -hmm. but this is day one. Okay. It was, um, she had eight stitches in this section here, and then she had three in the upper bite marks. Okay. So could you also show I, that to... Yeah. To I see. Yeah. Her mother saw it's it, because her mother helped. Okay. They rushed me into my bathroom, and they... So could you please send a picture of that? We'll give you the email address yes. entered into testimony. is just one picture of... This is the dog bite from the 7th? No. no, this is the dog bite. This is the, original, the, this is the, the dog bite from April. From April. April. The dog never Ah, okay. Dog sorry. Gotcha. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Sorry. Okay. You got me in the back. Any, any questions on that picture? The, okay. Yeah. So we've had the opportunity to provide testimony for both sides, the opportunity to cross each other and ask questions. Got a little bit out of order, but I think we've satisfied the opportunity for each side to ask questions. At this point, I'd like to ask... Mr. Elms, an opportunity to come forward and um, give his testimony. Uh, he's had an opportunity to provide a report. If he could uh, provide that report to the board, his experience here, as well as provide the board an opportunity, questions as well, before we entertain uh, the next steps after that and go to deliberation. Well, good evening. My name is Keith Elms. Obviously, I'm the animal control officer for the town. Um, would you like me to read my report in its entirety, or do you think we've... No, I think we that? have it okay. in the record. What I ask if you want to highlight any particular reports, we've all had an opportunity to review the report and can ask questions once you've presented salient points that you think um, are important for us to consider when we get into the uh, deliberation process. Okay, so I will start by start saying um, before the first incident where Miss LaBert was bit, there had never been any issues, uh, complaints of this dog ever reported to me personally you know, to animal control. Um, I first came in contact with Christina with the dog, with the LaBears, after that initial incident in uh, April when she was bit. Um, at the time, which is standard with any dog bite, we issue a 10-day quarantine. Um, at the time of the bite, I did offer Christina several suggestions, like she had talked about muzzling, um, tethering the dog in the backyard not allowing the dog in the front yard, consulting a trainer, going back to her veterinarian, explaining the situation, which she did, you know, for the most part, do all or, or attempt to do all those things. Um, when I went to release the dog after the 10 days, that's when the dog bit me. So she had the dog on leash. It was a very, very minor bite. I was wearing a jacket, so there was not much of a, just a very small puncture wound and a few scratches. So obviously I re-quarantined the dog. At that point, I explained to Christina her continuing to own the dog was going to require a major commitment to keeping the dog, you know, contained, keeping her neighbors safe, um, and just basically keeping the dog under control and on her property. And also it was going to present a large, you know, uh, personal liability risk to her were the dog ever to get out. There was another incident. Um, obviously I informed her it could end up in a hearing. Um, she could be sued civilly, things of that nature. So uh, I told her that I would... You know, I did relay that to Mr. LeBaire. I checked in with him. Um, I did tell Christina I would be checking in with her periodically over the next, you know, month or so just to see how things were going, how the dog was behaving, what the results of her visit to the veterinarian were, things like that. Um, I did check in with her on a couple occasions, and it wasn't until well, the June 7th incident where Ms. LeBaire, you know, sprayed the dog with the hose where I, had, I hadn't had any issues from, you know, my releasing the dog after it bit me from my uh, from its quarantine to to that date. So, I mean, I think at this point, um, I think the situation is pretty almost, I don't know, I'm going to kind of say cut and dry. I mean, if she's going to continue to own that dog on her property, that dog needs to be contained to that property. Um, what I suggested in my, you know, in my report to the selectman was, you know, if the dog's taken off property, it's muzzled. Um, that the dog is only allowed in the backyard attached to a tether or a cable run to minimize any chance for, you know, for escaping uh, were a gate or something like that in the backyard to be left open. And I had initially put that, a gate put on the um, front porch just in case the front door were left open would provide a secondary barrier for escape. But 
I honestly believe now at this point, just hearing both sides and hearing how the dog did escape um, on June 7th, there probably needs to be a physical barrier around that front yard. I think, you know, as we saw, I mean, there's a risk for, you know, um, someone leaving a door open, something of that nature. And I don't think any debate about an electronic fence is relevant because I really don't think that that should be used as a primary method of containment. There's just too many variables for it to fail. So regardless of, she's welcome to use it, but regardless of how it's set up, um, I, I don't think it, it definitely shouldn't be used as a primary means to keeping the dog. So whether she's doing training with it, whatever, I think it's irrelevant. I don't think we should consider uh, that as a way to keep the dog contained to the yard. So I think, I do think, you know, were she to, you know, depending on how the board ruled, were she continue to, uh, to continue to own the dog and keep it at 67 Worthington, um, it needs to be tethered or um, what I had written was uh, only be allowed in the fully fenced backyard of its owner or keeper and attached to a tether or cable run at all times in the backyard. And along with, you know, a physical barrier in the front yard as well. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Before we turn it over, uh, what we'll do here is uh, board members, and then if the, either parties want to follow up and ask any questions to the, Mr. Elms after we've had the opportunity, you'd be welcome to do so. Just a few questions before we turn it over. So when you were bit, mm. was there any warning? Did the dog just lunge? Did it bark? What did it do? Uh, when I went to go uh, release the dog from its quarantine, she brought it out on leash. Um, so she had the dog on leash. I was maybe a few feet away talking to her. Uh, the dog did bark a couple times when she brought it out initially, but it settled down and sat down right next to her. And yeah, basically without any, any real provocation. Uh, I was on the dog's property, but you know, it just, it just lunged and just grabbed onto my arm very briefly and let go. So. And then one other question. So if a dog is two years old and it's a hundred pound dog, German Shepherd, uh, it's had very little training to date. What kind of training or will training be effective? I guess is it at that point are its tendencies generally understanding that your, your opinion that how easy or how hard would it be to train a dog at this point that's had very little training? Well I'm not a professional trainer but um, I would imagine I don't want to speculate but based on the dog's age and just experience with the trainers I've talked to in the past I don't think there's any sort of guarantee but again uh, I guarantee you can you can train it at this age. I mean, I'm sure you can, but again, I'm not a professional trainer, so I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the authority on that. But given the dog's age, I mean, there, there's probably no guarantee of desired results. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. LeBeau. Uh, Officer Elms, um, and, and you may have touched on this. I just want to make sure I have it straight. After the dog bit you, how would you describe its behavior? Oh, she brought it right in the house. Okay. Yeah, directly. It was on leash, so yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't multiple bites, or, or it didn't try to. It didn't okay. try to attack after she restrained it. Or anything so when like the that. dog was removed to the house, could you hear it? Was it barking at you? Was it at the window or anything like that? Was mm. Was it taking on any kind of protective or aggressive behavior? Don't believe so. No. No. Okay. Have you had the opportunity um, to take a look at the? at the physical fence in the backyard and determine what condition you think it's I've in? I've never toured the backyard. I mean, it seemed adequate to me from the, from what I viewed from the front and the side, but no, I haven't been through the entire backyard to, to, um, to view the whole thing, which is why, you know, I don't want to rely on just the fence, you know? Obviously, if there was a structural issue or, you know, someone left the fence of the gate open, there really needs to be a tether or, or a run back there where, you know, the dog has a secondary, uh, secondary method of containment. Okay, and I, if I'm not mistaken, you recommended uh, certain specifications for a tethering device. Are you, are you, do you know if a, a device that meets those specifications is what's being used? I, one that meets these exact specifications? Well, uh, definitely not the length. Okay, do, does it provide the degree of uh, safety that you feel is appropriate? The one that she's currently using? Yes. Um, if, if it contains a dog to the backyard, yes. You know, but, but I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's of sufficient strength to... Uh, oh, I believe it's a, yes, yeah, sufficient a breakaway, strength. So I mean, I think maybe if it's 200 feet, that possibly a little too long. I would like to see a kind of a shorter one, but I think, you know, she, she sent me a, a copy of the one she bought, and it, it 
definitely would be adequate to restrain that dog. It's not, it's, it's uh, designed for a dog. It's not just like a piece of rope or something of that nature. Okay. A couple more questions, Please, if I may. Mr. LeBeau, um, proceed. It's a, it's a, it's a hundred pound, two year old, uh, some represented is still a puppy. Uh, in your estimation, is this dog getting enough exercise? I don't know. I'm, I, I, I guess, I, I guess, I you know, really. I'm not trying to be dog psychologist. No, here, no, but I it understand. seems to me that, um, you know, I mean, a that, dog needs to get out and run and move and, you know, that could possibly help with anxiety issues and, and, of course, um, it's, it's a possibility. behavior. Yeah, it's a, it's a possibility. Again, I'm not, I'm not a behaviorist. I'm not a trainer. And there is no law saying you have to exercise or walk Agreed. your dog. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, not enough exercise. It, it could contribute to, you know, restless behavior, I would assume. Okay, but you did mention just a couple moments ago you felt that uh, uh, physical containment in the front yard would, is your recommendation. Right. I don't think the dog should be in the front yard, you know, but, free roaming in that, but I think there should be some sort of barrier in that yard, you know, physical. Like, I don't think a, an electronic fence is, is adequate to, you know, contain it. Like I said, there's too many variables for it to fail. So, and obviously we've seen, you know, the even after she's done putting these precautions, a door got left open and the dog got out. So, I mean, there does need to be a physical barrier, I think. Okay, and one last question, and I understand you're not a behavioralist. Mm -hmm. uh, behaviorist. Um, it seems the dog feels that uh, Mrs. LeBaire is someone that the dog needs to protect the family from. Um, I mean, it's... You know, we're looking at this at the big picture. We're looking at this at the small picture. Nobody wants anyone to get bit. Correct. I mean, are, are there any means by which you know, Mrs. LeBaire can, you know, be socialized, I guess, for lack of a better word, with the animal that the animal no longer sees her as a threat? Uh, again, I mean, I mean, shepherds by their nature, I mean, they can be, they can be protective, mm -hmm. you know, so that would really be a question for, a, you know, a behaviorist or a trainer, I, I can't answer that with any, okay. you know, certainty. Thank you. That, that's all I have right now, Thanks, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. DePaulo. So, Officer Elms, if, if I could follow up on what Mr. LeBeau was asking. Um, i trying to think how to phrase this, but should, should the dog stay on that property? No. If the dog was going to stay on that property, mm -hmm. Should the dog have training or treatment to address the anxiety beyond Prozac? Because it, if the dog has anxiety beyond it, somebody could set it off. I don't care what the dog's taking unless he's, like, they doped up so much, can't do anything. So given the situation that we know, if the dog's going to stay on that property, do you have an opinion on whether or not that dog should be at least attempted to be trained and perhaps see a vet who can determine if the dog's anxiety could be addressed so that its behavior is changed? If it's going to stay there, it's going to stay on that site. Uh, I. I understand what you mean. I mean, I don't, again, I don't, there's no guarantee with, with going to a trainer that, you know, given the dog's age and that really hasn't been any training done before, that, you know, it can, it can be corrected or fixed. I mean, I think the issue is more, it needs to stay on the property and, you know, there needs to be, there needs to be uh, mm, surety it's going to stay on, you know, that we can avoid another another accident. I don't know if maybe going to, I mean, I wouldn't, I would say, I wouldn't uh, be against it going to see a trainer or a behaviorist. I just don't know if that would, that would cure the dog's anxiety. Okay. So we have another question. Mm -hmm. the, the yard's fenced in. Correct. Okay. Back up. Mm. Okay. Did, but the dog, your suggestion is the dog still should be on a run. Correct. So, Two methods of keeping the dog restrained. Correct. Okay. Is it 
a two-year-old dog um, to be tied up like that when it's outside all the time. I mean, how, I know you know behaviors, but well, we'd want to give it enough, you know, enough leeway to, you know, if it was on a cable run or something where it could get you know, adequate exercise. You said not the same as having a fence in backyard and the dog can run around. The dog is on a run, and the fence is really there just to, as a fail safe, theoretically, if the dog somehow got off the run. Correct. Okay. It, it, it just seems like <laughs> that's not a good life for a dog. I understand, but I mean, I, no, I know. I'm just I'm more out, thinking you know? out loud, right? Um, and trying to find, if, trying to find out if there is a solution. I mean, she's she's been tethering it in. Well, she claims she's been tethering it in the backyard mm -hmm. as it is. So I mean, it wouldn't be too much of a change. Okay. I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's a way to address this situation to hopefully prevent something from happening again. I mean, there's options in the law, uh, you know, of, of building, you know, keeping the dog in a, in a enclosure within the fenced-in backyard, not on a cable run. I mean, it would have to be a rather large one for the dog to get right. proper exercise, but... Can I just ask one other question? Good, Mr. DePaulo. If the dog's found to be a nuisance dog... Correct. ...as opposed to a dangerous dog... Mm -hmm. The nuisance dog, we have more latitude on restrictions. A dangerous dog, you have to follow A, B, C, D. That's correct. The seven. Right. Seven. That's the, the dangerous dog. They say these are the things. I don't know. They might you're be bound some others, to the but You're bound to the text of what's in the what's exactly. in the law. Correct. Yep. But a nuisance dog, you have more flexibility. Correct. You can take whatever action you deem necessary to ameliorate that nuisance behavior. Okay. I just I thought that what it was, but we haven't had a hearing for a little while. I just wanted to refresh my memory. Okay. Other questions for Thank Officer you. Elms? Mrs. Casaman. Hi. Um, it says in what you submitted to us that the tethering device should have a minimum strength of 300 pounds and not exceed six feet in length. That's the run in the backyard? Correct. But I thought I heard it was 200 feet long. That's what she's been using. Okay, so that's a really big difference. Which one? Is ex which one do you think is acceptable? Is there some middle ground? Is it six feet? Well, I mean, if you can't order the dog tethered to a, to an inanimate object, mm -hmm. you know, so it would have to be if you were to order it restrained in that manner, it would have to be on you know like a cable run mm -hmm. of some sort, which you know uh, you wouldn't want much longer than six feet, you know, but it would give the dog ample room to run back and forth. Okay. Okay. The difference between I thought the six feet was from the cable to the dog, not the cable running across the yard. Are you saying it, no, it's the, it the cable should to be the dog. that short, be a six-foot run? No, no. The, cable the, to the dog. That's just from the, that's just from the, dog the to cable the, to the to Oh, okay, the dog. all right. So, yeah, okay. yeah, no. I okay. thought that's what it was. I Any, just thought I heard That's what I, I wasn't sure. That's yeah. why I asked. Any other questions from members of the board? Mr. LeBeau. Officer Elms, I happen to notice in the uh, in the dog license one that the dog is altered, which um, one often thinks uh, helps control aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. But I also noticed that this license was uh, issued on June twenty second. Do you have any knowledge? Was this dog previously licensed? It was not. I it was not licensed at the. Like I said, I had never gotten a complaint about the dog, so I didn't know the dog existed at that point until the incident where it bit Mr. Bear the first time. So at that point, I told her, I gave her time to license the dog. She did submit the application. Um, she got it returned by the clerk's office for, for overpayment, um, which there was a kind of a delay in the time after she submitted it and when she, they sent it back. So I did call the clerk's office, and they said, yeah, she overpaid, so we sent it back, and she has since you know, sent the correct amount in the dog's license now. Sure, but I mean, just to your, and you may not know this, we maybe need to check with the clerk. Had the dog previously been licensed? Not to my knowledge, no. Well, I don't believe it was licensed last year, no. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Okay, um, any questions from Mr. LeBear or Officer Elms? Do you have any questions? He was off that leash in his yard a week ago. 
half about two weeks ago, okay. I was cleaning flowers and cutting stuff, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I heard him coming and barking, and he was at that fence growling. I never talked or anything, mm -hmm. but he knew somebody was there, so he came after it. Don't worry, Sybil, don't worry, they said. And I said, I am worried, because I know he's going to get me sooner or later. This was in the backyard, but he was off the leash in the road. Thank you. Mr. Well, Zano, any questions for Officer Elms? And then I'll turn back right uh, I do have one question. Just um, how old does the dog have to be for you to register him? So we got him when he was eight weeks old, but then we had. Uh, any dog over six months old has to be licensed statewide. Okay, I'm sorry. Any other questions at all? Okay, Mr. Elms, you, Officer Elms. You, you I was just going to say to, to uh, Ms. LeBear's <coughs> point where. The dog was off tether in the back. I mean, were you guys to order the dog restrained in that, that manner in the backyard and were that to happen in the future, even if the dog didn't exit the, the yard, I mean, that would still be a, a violation. So, you know, were she, not that I'm saying, I mean, hopefully the order would be followed, but were the dog to run unrestrained in the backyard in the future and she were to observe that, I mean, that would, that would be a violation of your, your order. Okay. Any other questions? So, Mr. DePaulo. Let's follow up on that. Sure. Do you have to see the dog? Unrestrained in the backyard, or is just somebody complaining that the dog's unrestrained in the backyard? I, it would be better if I could witness it myself, but I mean, you know, were there to be a photograph or video of something of that nature, we could use that. Or okay. I mean, if someone were to sign a, okay. fill out a voluntary statement or something like that, and you guys wanted to review whether it had any merit, we could do that as well. Okay. Any, any final questions? So I believe we've taken all the testimony at this point. I will, before we go into the deliberation phase, I'll entertain a motion that we um, end the public hearing. So moved. Second. Having moved and seconded, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Okay, so we've had the testimony. So based on the evidence, the testimony presented at us during this public hearing, um, we shall if the complaint's for a dangerous dog, which it is, we have three options as mentioned earlier. We d dismiss the complaint, deem the dog a nuisance dog, or deem the dog a dangerous dog. Uh, so it's, it's either dismiss a nuisance dog or deem the dog a dangerous dog. A dangerous dog is defined as a dog either without justification attacks a person or domestic animal causing physical injury or death or behaves in a manner that a reasonable person would believe poses an unjustified imminent threat of physical injury or death to a person or to a domestic or owned animal. And a nuisance dog is defined as a dog uh, that by barking excessive, excessively or other disturbance is a source of annoyance to a sick person residing in the vicinity or by barking excessively causes damage or interference that would disrupt a reasonable person's quiet and peaceful enjoyment or last has threatened or attacked livestock, a domestic animal or a person but such threat or attack was not grossly disproportionate, was not a grossly disproportionate reaction under all the circumstances. Uh, in addition, Section 157 of Chapter 140 of the Mass General Laws provides that, the, that we may not find a dog to be dangerous solely because of growling or barking, the breed of the dog, or if the dog was reacting to another animal or, or to a person and the dog's reaction was not grossly disproportionate to various circumstances listed under the statute. So those are the three determinations that we can make. And um, what is, I want to see where members of the board are given the testimony and given the standards under the statute. We have Officer Elms here that could answer any questions depending on the determination. Mr. DePaul. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, out, of the, out of the items that we could use, um, if the dog was found dangerous. These are the three that the animal control officers recommended. I think there's more than that. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember. I know what one of them is, and I'm not ready to go there. But um, do you have a full list? Because I, I do. I, I thought I did, them. but I don't. So I have, um, I read, there are seven under the statute. I will read them if you can bear with me one moment. Let me read them out. Uh, here, if the dog is deemed dangerous, then here are one of the seven that the one of the following, um, one or more of the following. One, that the dog be humanely restrained. Two, that the dog be confined to the premises of the keeper of the dog. Confined shall mean securely confined indoors or confined outdoors in a securely enclosed and locked pen or dog run. 
Third thing, the three, that when removed from the premises of the owner, that the dog shall be securely and humanely muzzled and restrained with a chain or other tethering device having a minimum tensile strength of 300 pounds and not exceeding three feet in length. Four, that the owner provide proof of insurance in an amount not less than $100,000, ensuring the owner or keeper against a claim, loss, damage, or injury to persons, domestic animals, or property resulting from acts, whether intentional or unintentional, of the dog or proof that reasonable efforts were made to obtain such insurance if a policy has not been issued. Five, that the owner of the dog provide to the licensing authority or animal control officer information by which a dog may be identified throughout its lifetime, including, but not limited to, photographs, videos, veterinary examinations, tattooing, or microchip implementa implantations, or a combination of any such methods or identification. Six, that unless an owner provides evidence that a veterinarian is of the opinion that the dog is unfit for alterations because of medical conditions that the owner shall cause the dog to be altered so that the dog shall not reproduce in seven or that the dog be humanely euthanized. So those are all seven. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. LeBeau. Question for the animal control officer, point of clarification. So I, if, if the board were to determine that the dog was dangerous, I believe um, under the second item about confining to premises, we could issue orders relative to maintaining a fence around the property, and we could also issue an order that the dog be on a, on a run. Uh, am I correct that that could be done under the dangerous? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I, he gave me his notes. I believe so. I mean, I think we could do that under item two. Okay, but and do you agree with me also that since uh, what may be done under the definite, if we would do deem the dog to be dangerous, it does not allow us the opportunity to um, order that the dog, uh, that the owner of the dog, seek the professional consultation of a behaviorist. I don't see how that's. No, that's so if the board wished to. Um, if the board felt seeing a behaviorist was a condition that it wished to include, we would have to take the nuisance route. Correct. Okay. Yeah, if anything, if the so dog's being dangerous. It's fascinating it's that we have much more um, flexibility um, under the nuisance portion of the statute than under the dangerous portion, but this is something that we revisit every time since this law <laughs> was supposedly improved several years ago. Okay, thank you. Anyone else in terms of thoughts as to whether on the complaint, whether a nuisance dog, a dangerous dog, or is, any thoughts? Mr. Chairman, point? you had mentioned the statute earlier, and I might have missed this. It has to be one of the three options. It cannot be a combination. It can't be both a nuisance and dangerous dog. Correct. The okay. statute would be, so the first thing we'll do is whether there's a finding, either we okay. or then we dismiss. Mr. Following Mr. LeBeau's line of questions, Officer Elmstead, it's under the nuisance dog, ironically enough, that there's more flexibility, and the statute prescribes only seven remedies if the dog is deemed to be a dangerous dog. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts as to where have we... So do you want to know what I'm thinking? Yeah, I'd like to okay. know what, what, what so, are we thinking in terms of... So. I think that regard, you know, outside of the law, I feel like the dog is dangerous. However, we have to act within the law. And so the dog, I believe, has to be deemed a nuisance so that we are able to put in place the kinds of restrictions and um, the, the ability to have some sort of training or a behaviorist. Like it gives us more flexibility in how we can help to solve this problem so that the neighbors are safe, people are safe, and the dog is able to stay with its owner. So as much as I believe that the dog is dangerous, unfortunately the law is making me say that the dog is a nuisance. 
Okay, anybody else? So one question for Officer Elms, just in terms of if it's the dogs deemed a nuisance, have in any of these, or in your experience, ever looked to the integrity of the fence? Is that ever a requirement that we see with this? Obviously, it's going to whether or not the dog gets additional training, a behavioralist, or anything like that. But what about we've had differing testimony about the fence, it's in progress. Is there any opportunity here as well if we're as a secondary source? Because what I heard during your testimony is that an electrical fence or however you see here, that's a not a primary uh, uh, stop. No, not a primary should be used as primary. Right. So if we Guys, deem, or, sorry, if the board deems a dog a nuisance, um, I mean, you may order further um, that the owner keeper take remedial action to ameliorate the cause of the nuisance behavior. I I see no reason why that couldn't, you know, be applied to addressing you know the structural integrity of a fence. I mean, it's pretty much whatever action you guys see fit to to uh, curb the behavior. <coughs> Mr. Lebeau. Well, Mr. Chairman, I mean, I, I asked a couple questions. I didn't really indicate my yeah, yeah, position, do. so I'm, I'm happy to do that now. I mean, the three, you know, I, I think that uh, there needs to be a physical fence or, uh, around the property that meets the uh, satisfaction of the animal control officer. Um, I believe the dog should be muzzled when off the property, and I believe we could do that under a dangerous definition. But I want I want all folks to understand that uh, we don't have as much flexibility to impose orders, oddly as it sounds, if we call the dog dangerous and we can do more if we call the dog a nuisance. I, I think the dog also should be <laughs> seen by a professional, so to speak. And since we can't do that under the dangerous uh, portion of the statute, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards um, that we find that the dog is a nuisance, that the uh, minutes clearly reflect um, what our non-legal uh, evaluation um, of the matter is. We, we heard the dog, I mean, the dog owner has made it very clear um, that the dog owner wishes to continue to own the dog. Um, um, we heard that the dog uh, wasn't a bad dog, but this was an unfortunate incident. And honestly, it's not our role to determine if it's a good dog or a bad dog. It's our role to determine if it's a nuisance, if it's a nuisance, if it's dangerous, or, or if it's not, um, I think uh, the owner has uh, a lot to deal with here, um, and uh, I, I honestly think we need to put some orders in place uh, that uh, would allow the owner to continue uh, to own the dog if desired. Um, but that we maximize uh, the safety of, of the folks in the neighborhood because um, we don't want another unfortunate incident. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, there was one, um, you know, serious incident, but there we've heard about two other uh, incidents that uh, could have easily uh, become serious. So I think we do see a little bit of a pattern here, and uh, if the owner wants to continue to own the dog, and I, I understand that. I mean, I've had dogs most of my life. Um, I think it's the board's uh, responsibility to put in some kind of controls to uh, better provide for public safety in the neighborhood. Thank you. Officer Alms, quick question on training. So we've talked about of behavioral analysis and maybe deal with the dog's uneasiness. But is there a specific type of training that could be recommended for a dog like this that's two that would be, I mean, how do we identify after X period of time if it's successful? Like, that's what I'm, as I'm hearing what my colleagues are talking about, going through the testimony in my mind from a training standpoint, are there training for dogs that are two years old with minimal training in the past that are out there, or what kind of training could there be? I mean, as far as whether you could tell if the training was successful or not, I guess the only metric would be, you know, whether anything ever happened in the future. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I guess there are things like canine good citizen training and mm -hmm. things like that, which offer a certificate. I mean, if she could complete a program like that, that would at least give some proof the dog has been through 
been through training. Um, you know, that's a pretty common common course that's not, you know, not uh, financially or or difficult to find, you know, mm -hmm. to, to complete that. Um, but, I mean, again, you know, we would, she, they would have a certificate that showed she went through training, but, I mean. Only part of the equation. I guess, you know, we'd never, we'd have to just trust that. And, I mean, I don't think training itself should just be solely relied on as, you know, yeah, as a method of control. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of if we go the nuisance route, altering future behavior. And part of it can be, I mean, reactionary trying to figure the dog's mental state, but part of it could be training or habitual to, to maybe alter tendencies that may, be, may or may not be part of the type of dog. So I'm just trying to think of if we go the nuisance route, what levers are available given the more flexibility outside this sort of seven rungs that are under the dangerous definition. So we've heard from a couple of colleagues. Where's the rest of the board on this? Mr. DiPaolo? Um, I guess without saying it all over again, I, I tend to agree with what Mr. Lebeau said. Okay. Um, I, I think this law is absurd, but um, it, I, I, I think if, short of euthanizing the dog, and I don't think anybody is there, mm -hmm. I, I don't think anybody in this board is there, um, it seems like the best thing to do would be to declare it a nuisance um, and put the um, conditions on it that we believe are appropriate as opposed to dangerous and being stuck with something that mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think, actually I don't think it goes far enough. So um, I'm, I'm in agreement with Mr. LeBeau. But, um, it sounds like we're all in about the same place with, mm -hmm. uh, sounds like we're getting to the same place as far as what we would require. Um, so I, I, I would be leaning towards um, a nuisance and have several more items than what it would be under, than under a dangerous dog. Okay. This is fun. So I agree with my colleagues, um, getting past the labeling of the situation, it's what we're going to do to prevent it from happening again. So focusing on what I think we require, I feel very strongly there has to be a fence around the perimeter of where the dog is. I think it was a very you know serious situation and looking at the injury, um, I hadn't heard anything that really gave me confidence that it wouldn't happen again. Um, I'm disturbed by the lack of, of action to take training. I understand it can be expensive, but um, it, it, it can't be at the expense of someone's safety. Um, so I agree that the actions that we require have to include a fence and have to include proper training if that dog is to remain at that residence. So what I'm hearing is, and Mr. DePaulo said it well, is that the consensus appears to be that at least the first rung of the, the analysis is that I'm hearing that leaning towards a, a nuisance dog with a flexibility or conditions that I'm hearing general agreement on that we probably spell out after we make the determination and just get agreement on those. So if, if I'm correct on that, I'd entertain a motion regarding the where, what our conclusion is regarding the dog. So again, it's one of three, the complaint be dismissed. We deem the dog a nuisance dog or a dangerous dog. Mr. LeBeau. Mr. Chairman, I move the board determine that um, German Shepherd Champ, uh, license tag number 2408, owned by Christina Tizano of 67 Worthington Ave, uh, be determined uh, by the board to be a nuisance for all the reasons uh, that were put into testimony at this hearing this evening. Second. Having been moved and seconded, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so now we've determined that the dog's a nuisance dog, and what I've heard so far, but for the record and for um, the uh, complainant as well as the dog mm -hmm. owner, together with the officer to go through the elements of this. Uh, what I've heard at least so far, but we want the record to be clear, is um, I think the first thing is the on the physical fence uh, in the backyard, 
What's the thoughts on the physical fence? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. My, my thoughts were that there'd be a physical fence uh, on the entire property okay. that, that uh, mm -hmm. meets the uh, satisfaction of the animal control office. Okay. And then that works? Okay. Yes. So that condition, I figure it's easier to go this way. And then you mentioned about muzzled. Is it uh, Champy similar to what the uh, Officer Elms had suggested be securely and humanely muzzled with a basket type muzzle went off the property of its owner or keeper is that what we're thinking so yes. that is the second condition yep. on leash too sorry on leash and on leash yes so it would read champ be leashed should securely yep you mainly muzzled and leashed went off premise okay mr chairman yes it's going to take some time for a fence to get around that whole house so until then, I think the dog needs to be muzzled when the dog is outside and off the property in any way. Yes. So the backyard, though, is fenced in right Correct. now. Correct. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I think one thing that we all have to take into consideration, and we'll work with whatever you decide, the fence in between their property mm -hmm. and my mother's property is not on their property. Okay. So. Any new fence or any, it, it's going to be moved as far as six feet in the back. It's not just a foot. On the front, it's about a foot. In the back, it's about six feet. Have to figure out so the this is just something we have to take into consideration as we repair and make the fence proper. It's going to be moved. It's going to be moved. Understood, yeah. but a secondary issue would be, yeah, yeah be their responsibility. Understood. To yeah, be okay, their responsibility sure as part of this order. Not our issue. Right. That's the issue of the <coughs> dog owner that would have to figure that out on their property. So we have, we have that. Um, what about, so I've also heard, just to be clear, on two parts of training. We have behaviorist type training and general training, um, or they one and the same, officer. No, that's, that's two separate things. Okay. So what's the, the desire of the board on that? We've it, had, yes, Mr. DePaul. It, um, I didn't catch what the, what the name of that training you were talking about, what the certificate was. Yeah, so okay, canine good citizen and timeline on that. Um, I know it's read within sixty days. Cert certificate enrolled within. Okay, but what about completed though? Sixty. Well, it's a, there's a, it's a, that program is a specific length of time. I'm not sure the exact length. Okay. But I'd so say it maybe enrolled within thirty days. So enrolled within thirty days in the canine program within 30 days. Is there any way we can kind of leave that a little open-ended, whereas if, if maybe that particular program's not or the available, first one that available. it could be one that I could approve? As a pro oh, okay. Or as substantially similar to that program Correct. as approved by the Animal Control Office? Correct, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's the third. What about behaviorist? I think it needs to be examined by a behaviorist and see, well, I think it needs to be examined by a behaviorist. And um at, at the completion of that they the owner needs to provide um the assessment of the behaviors to the animal control officer within review okay within how much i guess the well whatever i mean that's that might take a little i don't know it's dependent on how Within 60 days, 45 days? I mean, Mr. Chairman, my, I mean, I think we all know that professionals sometimes can't see patients right, yeah. right away. Uh, my, uh, one thought might be that uh, the dog owner uh, uh, prove uh, to the animal control officer that, um, you know, they have engaged okay. with a, a behaviorist. And I seem to remember in the past, I think, and I think it was with your predecessor, but I think we provided uh, a list of suggested or a, a list of uh, behaviorists from which um, uh, the, the dog owners might seek this training. And uh, if, if that is the case, that's how I would like it to be done, that we could provide a list of three or five, um, you know, recognized accredited uh, behaviorists that the, um, 
uh, the, the owner could uh, secure the services of uh, uh, behaviorists, secure the services within 30 days. Um, obviously, when that um, you know action is going to take place is going to depend on schedules. Um, Mr. DePaulo. Um, I, I remember um, that particular hearing, um, and town council said we could not specify who they had to bring it to. Okay. So we could say, you know, I, don't know. I, I think we should just leave it to your behaviors because we were told we, we couldn't do that. And I forget the exact reason why, but it's because we were prescribing what, okay. who they had to see. Um, we can define the timeline, though. You can find a timeline. So, I mean, if, if, if the animal control officer has, has a list of behaviors that you know about and they ask for it, that's one thing, but we can't require it. So, I, if that was the timeline, I, what, make the appointment, make an appointment within 30 days, make an appointment. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. And to address Mr. LeBeau's point that if it's six months out or four months out, the canine training's happening before then and the behavior right. is. Mr. Samia. Yes, Mrs. Kessler. Um, you know, I think that with the um, uptick in people getting dogs during the pandemic, it's challenging mm -hmm. to find a trainer uh, and a behaviorist I would think would be similar. I would want to make sure that if they're having trouble finding someone, that they let the animal control officer know so that we know. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can adjust our expectations accordingly, if need be. Okay. Mr. Mr. DePaulo, go ahead. Mr. Mitzikoff, once we write the order, we can't change it without another hearing, right? That's correct. So we need to be careful um, of what we do with that. We can't say, well, okay, it went, it went 45 days, you're not going to be able to do it for another 60. You either enforce it or you don't, or you got to come back. So mm -hmm. I think we need to be careful how we write it. Yep. Are we going to um, have a check-in at some point on the progress at all, or on a report from Mr. Elms? Officer, can we get an, an update in progress during this? A written, I guess written would satisfy. Sure, I mean, in 90 days or yeah. 60 days, okay. Yeah. Let's go 60, given the appointments in 30 and... Sure. A9 trainings 30 with some reasonable period after that if it can't start, but at least it's the idea would be completed and there should be some progress. Um, so what about, I guess, just so I have clarity on fencing. So we've talked about the whole yard, it's right? It's got to be the whole yard. But until the whole yard is done. And it's got to be confined to the backyard. Okay, so let's talk about that just to have clarity. Are we going with the recommendation from Officer Elms in his memo that until... The front yard's done. The dog has to be in the backyard. Is it muzzled in the backyard? And, or is it not muzzled? Let's just get clarity on that. Because I understand what our goal is, but until the front yard has a fence. I, not to overkill this with details, but we do. I think in fine to the backyard, on a run, um, you know, with the, with the 300 pounds, um, six feet on the, uh, what do we call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the teller. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm really not inclined to put the dog on a muzzle in the backyard the whole time. So I just, I think it's more, I think it's going to be counterproductive. I guess the on a runner like that, what would it be the end-to-end -end connection for security of that cable? So what is? How do we, given the strength of the dog, the weight of the dog, understanding that the um, strength of the cable, but what are the ends? How does that? As far as? So if it's the cables going end to end in the backyard, it can't be maybe the fence in the house, but what's the best way to secure the strength of that runner? Understanding it's only as, you know, it's a strength on the cable itself, but on the end is the fence doesn't seem to be very secure. It, it's well, it's got to be secured in a manner that um, is consistent with the strength of the run. And I don't think we want to get much beyond that because okay. um, I, we're not engineers. And I got you. I just have No, I, I think you're right. I think it, it, it needs to be something that Can be um, is adequate. Um, the tensile strength uh, to, um, 
It needs okay. to be equivalent to the to the um, strength of the run. So okay. And I could approve yep. before she buys it. Approve yep. whatever yeah. whatever's That's fine. presented or. Yep. Okay. And then just a silly point, but on the gate, can we have an automatic gate? The gate shut automatically, so they don't run the risk. Oh, that, spring. Um, you know, electric closer or electric lock or something something that will automatically or spring loaded or whatever to make sure that the gate doesn't stay open i'm just trying to think i think of um, i don't know what you i can't think of what you call it <coughs> yeah a, a, a hinge a self-closing gate yes self-closing gates fine and those are those are inexpensive and they're so we're having effective. the strength of the, the fence itself and a self-closing gate to take out the human element of it that it could possibly be left open. So we've talked about so we've talked about the fence, the back, but the order that a front fence be done, mm -hmm. when it be muzzled, leashed, professional training, um, behaviorist, automatic gate on the fence. Did I capture it all? Understanding the details. Self closing fence. Self closing fence. Anything else? And Officer Holmes, I think that's consistent with your recommendations with a few additions. It, it is. I, do we want to talk about any kind of details on the, the fencing of the, you know, the front yard? I mean, just because I was under the impression, I mean, obviously there are financial costs to it, but structures like that, they need to be approved by... What's that? Yeah, well, subject to zoning limitations. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Consistent with it has to be. Okay, so we can just say consistent with... Yeah, in a manner, obviously. Mr. Chairman, Mr. If, if, it's, if it's adequate to um, Isn't it below six enclose feet? Below six um, feet. the exit Something in the neighborhood. Go ahead. The exit of the house, the dog gets out the front door, because they try not to let it go out the front door. So if it's, if it's an area that's adequate to contain the dog, if it inadvertently gets out the front door, that's enough. I mean, we don't necessarily have to have the whole front yard in. If, the, if it, I don't know how big it is. If it's six by six or something from the door, or, you know, out from the so bottom of the stairs, it's enclosed from the house out. Like a bullpen or something. So yeah, it just catches adequate it. to contain it. So if it accidentally gets out. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that could be that, viable over doing the whole. That would work. That's right. and that from an economic standpoint. Right. It's it a secondary to... understanding through the testimony that the front is bolted if it happened to not be and the dog gets through if the front provides adequate protection. Yeah. And, okay. This is. Um, that's for the front. So it's very sure. similar to what we had to do with another dog a couple of years ago. Same. So that changes same the same thing. Yard fence. Yeah. It's backyard, and then the front is an adequate like bullpen. So right. Okay, I think we have everything. Do I have a? I'm going to read what we have there, just just to make sure, and then I'll take a motion, just to make sure it's clear for the record. Um, Please. So making sure the fence in the back is like eventually like assessed by Keith, yep. the animal control officer. Yep, to the satisfaction um, of the ACO, Ms. Officer Rounds. Yep. The bullpen in the front, just because the front door is usually bolted, so it's a secondary protection if it gets up the front. Muzzled until the fence is done. Right. We, uh, there's a good clarification. Backyard, no muzzle, but it's muzzled. Just okay. when it's unleashed. You when, it's when it's off premises. When it's off premises, muzzled. Thanks for the clarification. So backyard, not muzzled, right. as long as it meets the as long as it's requirements. On the right. As long as it's on the runner. No, but off premises, muzzled all times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the professional training, the canine good citizen, or anything that's similar or that Keith believes is like adequate to that. The behavior. One thing, Jim. Oh, sorry. Within, within thirty. Within, within thirty, 30 days. days on the canine training. Well, at least just start enrolled. Secure just start enrolled. Just, yeah. Correct. Yes, enrolled. Or, I mean, if it's possible where they can't get in within 30 days, at least. Or within such a reason. Secured, I thought it was secured at a point. Well, that was behaviorist. Oh, I see. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. So that, or is reasonably practicable thereafter. So mm -hmm. it's 30 days, which is a standard, not. Okay. And same thing with the behavioralist, at least having that, a secured that, appointment. That's an appointment within 30 yeah. days. Understanding the, the time lag and the comments that are being, okay. Uh, the self-closing gate. Yeah. And then the 90-day check-in from Keith. Yeah, the self-closing gate should be on all gates. Self-closing gate on all gates. Including, yeah, the bullpen. So that's there. Yep. 
Okay. Do we have agreement with that? Do we have a motion? Mr. Chairman, rather than <laughs> state it, I would simply like to say so moved to what you uh, just summarized. I get it. Having moved and seconded, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your respect. Like Can I be heard? Can I say something? Uh, at the point we're complete. Yeah, of course not. <coughs> Thank you. So next, we are now back to the agenda under new business item 10, review the Water Division's revised meter replacement program process. Is Mr. Snowden going to be presenting, or is that Mr. Mr. Riley, Mr. Ken are all still here. Mr. Riley and Mr. Snowden. Come on up. Everyone could. Oh, we know you. If you, for the folks at home, could introduce yeah, yourselves, sure. that'd be great. Thank you for your patience. Great to see you all in person. Hey. Welcome. So I'm Dan Riley, Water and Sewer Superintendent, joined by Hi, Joseph Kenny, Assistant Superintendent. And David Snowden, DPW Business Manager. So I'll start, and then David can join. Um, we're before you tonight with an update on our meter replacement. And um, the goal of tonight is, is really twofold in that um, we want to um, use this as a, a public uh, a mechanism to reach out to the public. We have about a hundred customers that we are not able to make contact with, despite um, our efforts, uh, multiple efforts to contact them, and um, also to gain your support to recognize that we are going to be making one more attempt to make contact with them, and we have a plan that uh, Mr. Snow has laid out to um, actually identify where their shutoff is for their um, curb stop, whether it's a commercial or residential property, and um, identify that with a blue stake to hopefully um, to get contact with these folks so we can um, get in and look at their meter to understand why it's not functioning. Um, and then eventually we're hoping to avoid having to shut anyone off unless <coughs> we do realize that, um, you know, that certainly is a reality. Um, and really, uh, Obviously, with this, um, one of our focuses is unaccounted for water. So every meter that doesn't work and is malfunctioning really um, takes a toll on that. And uh, Mr. Snowden and his team, as well as Mr. Kenny and his team, have really worked hard to get out and do a, a, a quite a few replacements already this year and, and worked with businesses and residents. And um, we've made some great progress, and, and we've really reached kind of a crossroad. So we thought it'd be prudent tonight just to come before the board and, and uh, discuss this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Review. Excellent. Um, so the, the plan outlined um, would be first having a hand delivered notices um, again to these locations one final time. Um, there is a commercial notice and a residential notice. They're, they're similar with the, the variance that um, most commercial meters that are greater than one inch, the replacement of the meter, um, the cost is borne by that owner. So we want to make sure that that is sort of made aware, but we have been working with vendors and we can provide uh, solid information to those customers as to what type of meter to purchase and we can aid in that process. Um, so we would do the hand deliver notices um, on July 1st. Um, we would also use our code red messaging system to also reach out to those specific addresses if they are, are signed up for code red as well and we can use our social media news flashes as well. August 2nd, um, addresses who fail to comply, um, failure to comply will be uh, determined as not reaching out with the town to schedule a shutoff within that 30-day window. So they may not be able to have a meter replaced at that time, but as long as we've made communication with them, um, they have complied. Um, so any location that has not complied by August 2nd will be identified as Mr. Riley um, mentioned earlier, their shutoff will be staked with a blue stake. And then during the week of August 2nd to August 6th, 6, um, depending on the schedule of Joe Kenny and his crew, water will be shut off at those locations. Um, there is a list of the addresses, residential and commercial, in the, um, the document, and then as well as the sample letter. 
And I think, um, to Dan's point earlier, a lot of work has been done. And um, this calendar year to date, we've replaced more meters than we did for the entirety of calendar year 2020. Um, and 100 more meters than in 2019. So there has been a significant effort to replace meters that age out or are not working. Um, and we really don't want to shut off water, but we're getting to the point where it may be the best course of action to address these other outstanding accounts. Any, okay, thank you. Yeah. Any questions? I have one quick question, actually, before I turn it over to my colleagues. So of these 105 accounts, actually I have two questions. 105 accounts, do any of those now, can we tell, have meter reading problems? I know in an earlier presentation to us, maybe some of the meters we weren't getting readings from. Any of these meters identified as a challenge for us in terms of we're just not, we don't think we're getting a right reading from them, or is this, have we gone that deep, or is it just we need to change these meters? I'm curious with any of these. Um, we have we have identified that these meters are not reading, whether or not it's um, the meter itself that's not working or the ERT. We're not sure unless we can physically get in the home, and Joe can speak more to that. Um, in a lot of instances, we have been reaching out to these residents um, or commercial entities beforehand, mm -hmm. um, and we've either gotten no contact or we've had scheduled, scheduled appointments that have been canceled, scheduled, canceled, scheduled, canceled multi multiple times. Um, so yes, I think to answer your question, okay. we have identified these as problem meters, problem okay. accounts. Okay, so that's yeah. going back to unaccounted for water, what you have talked about before, and we looked at the, maybe it was March, the yep. gallonage that you looked at in year over year. Just, I don't know if there's an answer to my next question. Um, you know, what if there's a language barrier? I mean, you have a bunch of these homes that, I, mean, I don't know how we identify that, but if we send this letter to them, maybe knocking on the door, and I know we talk about hand delivery, but the letters may be helpful, but if there's a language barrier, I don't know if we've had any issues like that in the past and how we've dealt with it, but maybe there's not an answer, but that may be a cause of it too. Not for the commercial necessarily, but the residential. Um, so I don't know how, how we address that, or probably just hand delivery at that point would be the best way. To, uh, before we shut off their water. And we're going to try to make contact. That's yeah. going to be the goal is to actually get to the door, and then if, if it is something like that, we'll identify that <coughs> and, um, and circle back around whatever you know, we, we need to, to make um, the appropriate contact. But we're going to try to knock on the door and really you know, just to you know, talk to folks. Okay, which is identified here. It's fine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Colleagues, any questions or comments? Mrs. Yeah. Casavant. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, thank you. You talked about make an appointment, cancel the appointment. What happens if that continues here? Because it says, you know, be advised failure to comply within 30 days from the date of this notice will result in termination of water service. So until the meter is replaced. But if they make an appointment and then cancel it and do that again, like, it's yeah. really. Um, I guess that my interpretation or the approach of it, if they make the appointment and then cancel it, then, then the water will be shut off. It's sort of like a, a hard stop. Okay. And there may be circumstances where the cancel <coughs> cancellation was justified, and we can review that as an as-needed basis. But um, I think we're sort of want to just move past that now. Follow up. Sure. Should that be in the letter? I, I think that, if that that's good language. If this appointment yeah. is cancel, if you need to cancel this appointment, please contact and make sure they get someone to actually speak to. Yeah. You can definitely add that link. That's very helpful and it's good clarifying clarification. Anyone else? Mr. DePaulo. Um, a couple of things. Um, have we done certified return receipt house, mailing to these houses? When we, no, we did not, no. Um, you guys do it however you think is best. I think you should try that because it also gives you a record of whether or not they picked it up or not or refused it, refused the letter. Yeah. Um, Sir Paul, if I, if, if I could just 
right now with the pandemic, the U.S. Postal Service is signing that those items are delivered. They're not requiring home office. Oh, really? Okay. So, well, I guess so much for that. Yeah. Um, that's why. <laughs> <even, laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, I didn't realize they did that. Yeah. Um, I think home deliver, hand delivering it is going to be just as problematic as mailing it. I think you forget whether or not it's return receipt. I mean, you're going to have to, you, you may not be able to do it on an eight to five schedule because if people are working, you're not, if, if you just leave the thing there, I mean, you can say you delivered it, but it, it's not going to be effective. So I think you need to do both. Um, that, that, that's my opinion. And then I would, <clears throat> I would um, suggest two things. You don't do shutoffs on Fridays. So if somebody says, hey, I didn't pay my bill or I can't let you in, whatever, they're not out without water. I, I know you could go send somebody out special to turn the water back on, but I know, not in our town, but I, I know there were problems with meters were getting turned off, electric meters or whatever the heck they were. And they were doing one on a Friday afternoon. People didn't have time to, to respond. Um, and the other last thing I would do is if you're going to shut that water off tomorrow, I would, today, whatever today is. If you're going to turn it off Tuesday, Monday I'd go and slap an orange thing on there and said, if you don't contact, this is your last chance. If you don't contact us, you're done. We're going to turn it off. I give them, don't, I, I, I know they're being difficult by not, by not accommodating you, but I think we have to demonstrate that we've made every effort, and it's it is way up uh, above and beyond. But I think it's I think it's necessary, and I wouldn't count on the code code red so much if 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 people aren't on code red, that that message is useless. Yeah, it, it you can use it yeah. as another. Yeah. It, yeah. it would be okay to use it as another source, um, I, but. I don't, I don't think you say you, you sent out a code red and 25% of the people aren't on it. I just think you need to be careful. I agree with everything you're doing. And I think it, it's, it's, we're way past time because I know you've been frustrated by this. I just think we need to make sure that we've demonstrated that we've really gone out of our way to, to accommodate them. And, you know, I don't... And the thought with, with um, going out and identifying the shutoff, putting the stake in painted blue is, is hopefully another visual right. that maybe your neighbor says, hey, the water department's right. trying to get in touch with you. I did this in another community right. I worked in, and it's very, it, that was very effective in getting folks' attention as well. No, I, yeah, and if, you know, maybe you, <laughs> you know, like on the trash thing, you put the sticker on the, on the thing, Everybody somebody goes, I read, hey, you know, I, I, yeah. I just think more is better in this case because sure. it, I know we need to do it, but I think turning off somebody's water is pretty. We'd rather not do it. Right, exactly. Ra yeah. Um, and some people are going to call you bluff, but that's their choice. Anyways, I think, I think you've done a good job on all of this. I know you're trying really hard, and I encourage you to keep doing it. Um, uh, so just hopefully it works. Anything else? Thank you. For your presentation, for you, and thank you for your patience. Thanks, Thanks for your hard work thank too. You all. Great right, to see you, you in person. Yeah. It's nice to be here in person. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> Next item on the agenda on the new business is to <laughs> review and act on the constable reappointments of John Giannath, 14 Lamplighter Drive, Reju um, Ananth, 14 Lamplighter Drive, Robert Esposito, 237 Maple Avenue, and John Manzi. 20 Hillside Drive for a one-year term to expire on June 30th, 2022. Move approval of all. Second. That be moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item is review and act on the reappointment of Nancy Bernard, 30 Hillcrest Avenue to the Historic District Commission for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024. Move approval. Second. Have been moved and seconded. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion aye. passes unanimously. Next item is to review and act on the reappointment of Thomas Kennedy, 17 Gates Road to the Retirement Board for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024. Move approval. Second. Have been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item is to review and act on the reappointment of Stephen F. Madaus to Sprucewood Lane, Worcester, Mass. 
uh, for a one-year term to expire on June 30th, 2022. Move approval. Second. I've been moving and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item is to review and act on the town manager's reappointment of Diane Burns, 49 Monroe Street, to the Commission on Disabilities for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024, pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 8J. Move approval. Second. Have been moved and seconded. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Um, next item is to review and act on the town manager's reappointment of Leonora Ryan, 11 Atwood Lane, to the Commission on Disabilities for a three year term to expire on June 30th, 2024, pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section HA. Move approval. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item is to review and act on the town manager's reappointment of Kenneth F. Polito, 8 to Tacit Circle, to the Conservation Commission for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024, pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 8C. Move approval. Second. I've been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Review and act on the next item. Review and act on the town manager's reappointment of Jason J. Port, 43 Woodland Road, to the Conservation Commission for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024, pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 8C. Move approval. Second. Have been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item is to review and act on the town manager's reappointment of Melissa McKenna, 871 Main Street, to the Historic Commission for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024, pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 8D. It's yes. a historical commission, right? I thought you said historic. Sorry, I misspoke. Historical. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Move approval. Second. I mean, moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And uh, finally, review and act on the town manager's reappointment of Paul F. Schwab, 38 Browning Road, to the Historical Com Commission for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2024. Pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 8D. Move approval. Second. I've been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations uh, to everyone on their reappointment and thank you for your service. Next item is to review and to designate the members and positions of the following as special municipal employees pursuant to Mass General Laws, Section 268A. Mr. Mizikar, we need to take these separately, correct? Separate. So I'll entertain a motion, it's two separate motions for a 21A and 21B. Mr. Chairman, move the board designate the members of the Community Preservation Committee as special municipal employees pursuant to MGL 268A. Second. Have been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, I move the board designate the members and positions of the affordable uh, housing trustees as special municipal employees pursuant to Mass General Law 268A. Um, second. I've been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next item is review and act on town manager performance evaluation. Board members, as you recall, at our last meeting, we went through a thorough review of Mr. Mizikar's evaluation. We had noted at the end there were a couple uh, just numerical discrepancies, which I believe has since been uh, corrected. So in front of us is his review as corrected, uh, seeking approval if it's met the satisfaction of everyone on the board. I'll entertain a motion. Move, uh, I'm, excuse me, move the board, uh, approve the town manager performance evaluation as presented. Second. I've been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. It was a great review, Mr. Mizikar. Thank you for your hard work. Next item under item 23. Review and vote to sign amendment number one to the intermunicipal agreement between the city of Worcester and the town of Shrewsbury for public health services through June 30th, 2022. Board members, I had an opportunity to speak with uh, Mr. Mizikar and Mrs. Lawson. Correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, if, but the summary is as follows, that the cost in year three of the IMA was increased year over year from uh, 2020 or 7119 at June 30th, 2020, and the following year and the following year after that, roughly about a 2.5% increase. However, in light of COVID in year three, 
um, it was about an upcharge of a dollar per resident of Shrewsbury, hence the increase from 163664 to 203430 just for year three. And there'd be a new agreement negotiated, so the $203,430.96 wouldn't necessarily serve as the baseline going forward. This is just related to COVID expenses, so that is the change in cost. And then Schedule A, or excuse me, Attachment A, the changes are, we, we've seen this attachment before, look very familiar looking at it, but the scope of services has been amended to include COVID-related services is the fundamental change. And attachment B, based on my conversation with Mrs. Loss today, it appears that attachment B, because it refers to attachment A, is, is joined together the way they do it, so it couldn't be somehow interpreted as attachment B referring to old attachment A. So that is a summary of the lawyer's key every time, but overzealous representation, but that is what we have in front of us. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I move the vote, the board vote to sign amendment number one of the intermunicipal agreement between the city of Worcester and the town of Shrewsbury for public health services through June 30th, 2022. Oh, second. <laughs> Evan moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. We'll skip over to correspondence and then we will be going to executive session. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I will, <laughs> let me go through uh, correspondence. I had summarized stuff, so bear with me real quickly here. But item number 26, email dated June 8th, uh, 20, there we go, 2021 from Brian LeBaire, 218A South Quinsigamon Avenue, Ray, uh, Chapter 140, Section 157, Dangerous Dog, which we had the hearing this evening, so noted. Um, item number 27, email dated June 9th, 2021 from Catherine Leary on behalf of the Alzheimer's Association of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, 100 North Parkway, Worcester, Mass, 01605 regarding um, information, uh, let's see, it's a promise garden and promise flowers to be put on property. I think near the library, June 18th to June 30th, so noted. Next item. 28 is email dated June 9th, 2021 from Jeffrey Holland, Director of Public Works. Re, uh, the reason of Ma Maple Lab traffic study, which was alluded to earlier today, which related to a traffic study in February of um, last year, 2020, right? Uh, 2019, thank you for correcting me on that. So noted, item 29 is an email dated um, June 10th, 2021, from Karen M. Stoyanoff, 8 Alden Ave, Reason St. Mary's Main Street Parking, a dangerous situation, which is pointed some uh, some information. Did you want to talk about that at all? Sure. As part of the uh, Main Street resurfacing project, we'll be adding additional curbing in front of St. Mary's Church, uh, with the exception of a bump out for uh, various uh, vehicles that would access the church. Um, and this should significantly limit anyone's opportunity to uh, park in that area, which is uh, causing a dangerous situation. Thank you. So noted, uh, email item number 30. Email dated June 11th, 2021 from Jacob Missile, uh, 23 Cypress Avenue, rebuilding a skate park. Uh, Mr. Missile had asked about building a skate park behind the municipal soccer fields on Maple Avenue, and we've since responded to him. Um, but we've assured him that we, we acknowledge and agree that um, skateboarding is a great sport, a team sport. And um, well, right now, after speaking with Mrs. Snell, that the Parks and Rec Department has a long list of projects to undertake. However, I'd welcome a chance to speak with him going forward about uh, skateboarding in general. Um, but it was a well-written letter, and it's great to hear from someone from our community. Next item on the agenda, uh, so noted. Uh, uh, is 31 under correspondence letter received June 15, 2021 from Isha Gupta, 45 Stony Brook Lane. A thank you card regarding the town of Shrewsbury scholarship. I believe um, she is, I've taken notes, but I don't have it, but she will be going to Case Western Reserve University uh, majoring in psychology on the pre-med track. That's outstanding. Another uh, fine young individual from our community going on to great things. Next item is an email. Dated June 15, 2021, from Jackie Cassis, Mass Lottery, reason of a Kino expansion at, um, there'll be a Kino monitor, I guess, at JNM Market, 117 Clinton Street, Shrewsbury, um, so noted. Next item under the correspondence is email dated June 16, 2021, from Representative Kane regarding legislation extending certain COVID-19 policies, including um, the ability to have virtual meetings or 
being able to comply with open meeting or outdoor dining and all of that. That the has that been passed? I know the Senate had the bill, but was it passed? Yes. Okay. Uh, so noted in 34 email dated uh, June 16th, 2021, from Chief James Vona. Reason the legislative breakfast will be in late September. So noted. And last item on correspondence is letter received June 18th, 2021, from <coughs> Ella Gallagher of Maori, nine. Brightside Avenue, and thank you card regarding Town of Shrewsbury Scholarship. So we've had a very, Can yes, Mr. On 27. Yes, sir. Um, didn't the, the author of that ask for permission to plant? Did we? She, she had um, decided that she would like to have those um, flowers Planted at the library, so we've referred her to the library. Oh, okay, so we don't need to act on it. Okay, that's why I was just wondering if we need to act on it. Okay. Okay, so we've, unless there's anything else, any comments or questions, I'd entertainment, uh, an entertain a motion that we go into executive session, uh, seeking that we go into executive session for two reasons. First, under general law, chapter 30A, section 21A6, to consider the purchase exchange or lease of value of real property for Beale School 107 Maple Avenue. And the second reason under general law, chapter 30A, section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union per non personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with, con negotiations with non-union personnel with the town manager. Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the board vote to enter into executive session pursuant to General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 2, for the purposes listed on the agenda. Second. Have been moved and seconded. A roll call vote is required. Mrs. Cassavan? Aye. Mrs. Flynn? Aye. Mr. DePaulo? Aye. Mr. LeBeau? Aye. Mr. Samia? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. The board will now convene into executive session pursuant to General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A6, to consider the purchase, exchange, or lease of value of real property in General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to con conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Furthermore, the board will not reconvene back into open session. Thank you for joining us, and good night.